Jacob Benson. What's up, man? Good to sit down with you, man. Yeah. We used to do this all the time at Sam. Never recorded, though. Never recorded. Thank God. Man. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> we'll see if we're ready for it now. Yeah. Yeah, man. So you're in Wyoming. Yep. We're all in Wyoming right now. That's true. We we're all in you. Wyoming. The uh, least populated state in the union. Is that what it is? Yeah. Is it a good state, though? Yeah, it's great. I mean, there's no people here. It's awesome. <laughs> it's it's the 10th largest by size, and there's like just over half a million people. Dude, the landscape. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Tetons, Yellowstone. What was it again, Josh? The Red Red Rock Canyon? Yeah. That was beautiful. Were there any elk in it? Uh, no, but they said oh, okay. 70,000? 700. <laughs> 700. <laughs> 700. Yeah. Uh, 700 elk. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Maybe a little bit more. They, they can't catch all of them. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, it's a beautiful place. It is. You've been out here now for? Well, I've been here for two years, but I grew up here. Yeah. So like the first uh, 20 some years yeah. and then the last two years. Yeah. And a lot of good things going on here. Yeah, this it's great for our church body. Uh, this is the place to be. Yeah, some good educational things coming down the pike. Yes. We're going to talk to Christian Preuss about that. Okay, yeah, just out that window. Yeah, there's going to be a college. Yeah, yep, some exciting stuff. But I want to talk to you about a lot of things. Cool. But I definitely want to talk to you. Uh, there's a question I I seem to always get. It comes up in Bible study, and I I'll, I'll tell you what my answer is. But they'll ask, and I'll say, well, you know, Pastor, what about like Judaism? Can you talk about Judaism? And my answer is always, uh, no, <laughs> I just don't, I don't know. And I always reference, I'm like, well, I got a guy who really does. So when we were kind of putting together this podcast and we want to be able to, to highlight individuals that have, you know, they've, they've spent time studying these specific topics. So you're the resource that I keep referencing where I'm like, I'll, I'll get that information for you and you're the guy. So I want to help, I want to help the viewers understand what is Judaism you know, distinct from Christianity today, historically, all of this, you know? Yeah. So I think the, the folk understanding or the idea that we have is there's this religion called Judaism and then Jesus is born, right? He, he lives, he dies, he rises, he ascends. And then all of a sudden you have this thing called Judaism and this thing called Christianity, right? Um, this is the same way people will speak about the Reformation, right? You have the church, and then 1517 happens and you all you have the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church as though there's always these clean breaks. Uh, so Judaism is is just as complex as Christianity in terms of its traditions, where it comes from, how it grows. So one of the terms that gets used a lot is ancient Israelite religion. And that's kind of like an academic term, but I think it's a better way of thinking about it. So sort of what we're dealing with in the Old Testament is this ancient Israelite religion. It's focused around the temple, uh, you know, the sacrifice, the reading of the scriptures, the prayers and everything. And one of the, the fascinating things that I love just reading the Old Testament is how many times you, you read a passage about somebody discovering like the book of the law or Deuteronomy or Leviticus. And it's like they forgot about the Bible. So they had this liturgical existence, right? But every once in a while, you kind of, they had to rediscover scripture. So and by scripture, you're referring to like the Torah, first five books? Yeah, right. Or? And there's um, there's a, a list, you know, there's so many books referenced in the Old Testament that we don't have, or we don't always know if we have them. So you have like uh, the book of Jasher, the sayings of the kings, you know, you have all these things, you know, is it not written in X, Y, and Z? So there's all sorts of these writings going on. Some of them um, become what we call the Old Testament or the Torah, the first five books of Moses. Uh, but the big thing in this ancient Israelite religion is the temple, right? Shedding blood to atone for sins. And the prophets say again, and or God says through the prophets again and again, if you keep chasing after false gods, I'm going to take the land away from you. Mm -hmm. And push comes to shove, that happens in 586, right? The temple is destroyed. God's people are sent into exile. And what do we do? So our whole religious identity is about worshiping at the temple, right? Having priests make these sacrifices on behalf of the people. And now, you know, you have this snap moment where you have to almost reinvent the religion. So, hey, what do we do with, uh, with without this sacramental liturgical reality? All we have left is the sayings of the fathers, right? Oral tradition and the, the writings that we have. So some of the prophets at that point, quite a few of the prophets and the books of Moses. So this is, you said 586. So this is the Babylonians have just, they've right. conquered Jeru or, uh, Jerusalem. Yep. Um, they brought them into captivity. So is it almost fair to say, can you say there's kind of this first chapter 
of Judaism, which is free the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that would begin at the with Solomon, or is there almost a is the first stage before the building of the temple, the second stage after the building of the temple, or would you jump those together? Yeah. So the I mean, the tabernacle and the temple. I don't think we should you know be so radical in, in dividing those up. Mm -hmm. So if you read is it Exodus twenty four. Right when when the Lord is giving Moses the, the the instructions for building the tabernacle, they are so precise, right? So it is this very um, it, it, it's a pre temple of sorts. Mm -hmm. So I would say sort of the first chapter is well I don't know Genesis is is hard to divide or maybe it's easy to divide up in all these different sections, right? Right, because you got Abraham and yeah, Abraham. right. So we'll say like maybe um, you know formalized Judaism. Yeah, is probably a so after the whole Exodus event, mm -hmm. right? Wandering in the wilderness, this is where ancient Israelite religion really gets. So obviously we have sacrifices in the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. but it's sort of assumed, right? So, you know, Cain and Abel are making their sacrifices. Yeah. Right? Abel's making a blood sacrifice, right? Exactly, mm -hmm. right? And uh, God likes that one more. Yeah. Uh, kind of interesting. <laughs> that's how I preached on it. Yeah. Uh, not everybody does. But, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Um, and then, well, so is the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, and then even in the flood, right, Noah makes this distinction between clean and unclean animals mm -hmm. even before the law is, is given through Moses. So there's this idea of what, what religion is supposed to look like. Yeah. So, so okay. So if we're going to understand Judaism as a whole, you really got to go back to some of these themes. Yeah. Right? So priesthood's there mm -hmm. pre-Israel. Yeah. Right. Maybe I got Melchizedek at least. Um, sacrifice is there. Those are not only in Judaism. This is in every ancient religion, right. right? Like these are things that are just built into the human understanding of what any kind of relationship with God is going to entail. Mm -hmm. Now these things get formalized and we get divine inspiration on the way these things are structured when we get to Israel. But maybe it's important to understand that those things are right off the bat. These are these motifs or themes. Right or distinctions for worship life and relationship with God that are built into before we even get formalized Israel. Yeah. Right. Are there any other things that, you know? Yeah. I mean, when, when, um, you know, Joshua is, is conquering the land, you know, when they, when they conquer these other people, they have temples mm -hmm. with, with gods in them and altars of some sort. Now, I think one of the, one of the biggest differences is in these pagan religions, you're offering something to God for God's sake. Mm -hmm. Whereas in in um, the system that gets unpacked in the uh, Levitical sacrifices, you're offering a sacrifice to God um, sometimes as a thanksgiving, but the most important one is the blood sacrifice, right? To atone for sins. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that idea of atonement we really have in any other Near Eastern religion, at least at that time. So is it more of like an appeasement of the gods? Like the gods are thirsty for blood yeah, in these right. pagan religions, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the, the whole the Asherah. Uh, that mm -hmm. we read about throughout the Old Testament, it's this, I mean, I don't want to be too crass, but it's a fertility, right, of, you know, well, if if there needs to be this rain that comes down from heaven to give growth to our crops, right, we have to have these, you know, incredibly, you know, phallic gods or these, you know, mm -hmm. uh, busty, fertile-looking gods in order to show that we want the this fertile earth as well. You need temple prostitutes, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to sort of show the gods what they're supposed to be doing, yeah. right, in order to, to create this. So this is where... Where Judea, or where the ancient Israelites are all, always in tension because they that religion is so much easier, right? That religion makes sense. But when you have this God whose name is I am, who lives in heaven, but his footstool is on the earth, and he's also wholly outside of this existence, and yet he participates in this existence in a box that you carry around, and if you touch it the wrong way, you fall down to like that religion doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense, I think, that that the that God's people are like, hey, we, we want to be like everybody else. I'm not excusing it, right? It's just yeah. natural. They say we want kings like everybody else. Um, and they, of course, they want gods like everybody else too. And this is where God eventually, I mean, he gives them the kings and he says, just wait, this isn't going to work out. Mm -hmm. Of course it doesn't. Um, it doesn't work out with, with Saul. It doesn't really work out with David. And then Solomon builds the temple and everybody says, okay, great. Like now, now we look like everybody else because we have a king, we have a temple, we have um, riches. We're sort of a, a legitimate nation now. Mm -hmm. And that's where that comfort, you know, destroys religion yeah. because they're so comfortable. So God takes it away by throwing them. And so I would say that ends, yeah, maybe we can call it the first chapter or sort of the I think the building of the temple is the perfection of 
of what Moses and God's people are doing on their way out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that perfection includes God's wrath, right? Taking that down. Yeah. So I mean, if you want, if you were to choose a time to live, mm -hmm. you know, probably during <laughs> Solomon's reign, right? Like, yeah, early on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So this is, so that's, yeah, I think it's helpful. I think, cause I think most people, when they think of Israel, that's what they're thinking of, mm -hmm. right? They're thinking of King David, King Solomon temple. Maybe they're even thinking of that time in, you know, th throughout the Exodus as wandering sure. in the wilderness, Jericho, all these kind of things. Like that's what people think of when they think of Israel. And it's fair to say those are kind of the golden days of sure. Israel, right? Like that's certainly when God is in more constant communication, you know, certainly throughout that Exodus period, certainly with like David and Solomon, there's a lot of back and forth in communication and communication and directions and things like that. Worship life is prevalent. And you're saying during this time, one of the defining factors of Judaism is going to be that sacrificial system. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? That's, that's at the core. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the idea of, uh, so I'm still hesitant to say Judaism just because when we say Judaism, we usually think of, you know, uh, well, you and I used to be on the East coast, right? You know, you, you saw yep. Jewish synagogues all the time, right? Uh, in Wyoming. Yeah. I mean, there's one. It's, it's a wild west. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, so I'd still say at this point, you know, Israelite religion or, um, the other word that gets thrown around a lot is Yahwism. Mm -hmm. I think that's just unnecessarily pretentious, yeah, but you yeah. know, so Israelite religion and yeah, like you said, that's what people think of, but I mean, David's like a thousand years before Jesus, that's mm -hmm. a lot of history. And so you have this, yeah, the idea of God has to, uh, appease himself, right? That sin has to be forgiven. Sin has to be atoned for. The sacrifices is how you is how you do it. But now all of a sudden we're in Babylon. There's no temple, right? We we can turn west and we can pray toward where the temple used to be. Mm -hmm. But there's still no temple there. So how's that? Uh, can you just kind of walk through how that leads up to? Sorry. So you got David, Solomon, then you got a lot of bad kings, a couple good kings right. over the course of what 400 years, give or take. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. And then you've got so it's kind of ramped up. The northern kingdom, right, has been destroyed mm -hmm. by the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. Now you've got the Babylonians who are the main power. And what leads up to that destruction of... of yeah, so you, you can read that uh, historically or you can read... I mean, and you can read it theologically. Mm -hmm. So I think the the historical part is fun, right, to look at sort of the the economics of how Babylon came to be a world power. You know, that is really fascinating. Um, but also to look at God's people and what they were doing and just the continued um, disregard for God's word. You know, the fact that people are rediscovering the Bible <laughs> shows that that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This Sometimes like 70 years, right? Like I, I remember reading at one point in maybe oh, yeah. Kings or something. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, they didn't have the Bible for 70 years. Like they weren't reading. Right. And, and you know, to, to jump ahead a little bit too, it happens when they build the second temple. Is it Nehemiah? It's like, hey... <laughs> Do you guys know that we're supposed to be, you know, celebrating these festivals and, and praying and doing all this? It would be like if we, you know, you've been going to a Lutheran church for the last 70 years and every week you have the Lord's Supper and the pastor, you know, um, does the liturgy perfectly. And then after 70 years, he's like, guys, I totally forgot. We were supposed to be reading the Bible wow, the yeah. whole time too. Yeah. So you have the liturgy, you have all the externals, but you don't have, um, you don't have the proclaimed word. The, the word not yet made flesh, right? A, a friend, I'll, I'll give his name a shout out, Jean-Marc Ledoux. Uh, he gave me a great illustration on, on that point. And he said, it's like a coral reef because a coral reef will die, but its structure will stay there for mm -hmm. decades, you know, but there's, a, there's actually no life within it. And it's That's kind of awesome. that way where like that structure is there, but the lifeblood that, that that's meant to be there has, a, right. has vanished. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so then what do you do in that moment, you know, of we don't have a temple, we don't even, you know, God promised this land to us generations ago, and we're not even there anymore because of what we did. Mm -hmm. We're now thousands of miles away. So this but, is, but even backing up. So they've, yeah, yeah. So they've been rejecting this and it, right. it's ramped up. Is that right? As yeah. we're leading, leading into this Babylonian, you know, rising and then the destruction of Jerusalem. I think so. I mean, the, you know, the hymn writers, uh, Christian poets talk about sin as being inbred mm -hmm. all the time. And so I think we should always think of sin, you know, getting quantitatively worse with each generation because we are, you know, inbreeding that sinfulness. And so we should expect things to always get worse in yeah. terms of, of, uh, so if I lead my kids astray with bad parenting, they're going to be more apt to lead their kids even further astray. Yeah. That kind of to the third and fourth generation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they get, then they get to this, to the point where they've, at this point, would you say they've 
pretty much just they're, they're probably not even doing maybe some of these temple sacrifice i mean they lost it that bad where even the shells not so much there anymore is that what's leading into this babylonian destruction or is there something yeah so you th there's you definitely have shades of that right there mm -hmm. there are um we read about bad priests in scripture so you don't really get the the overt open bad religion in the temple until the second temple period mm -hmm. um but yeah definitely you have false teachers in the early early israelite religion mm -hmm. yeah okay so then the babylonians come in right they destroy and then they take the leaders daniel shadrach meshach and yeah. all these guys back into babylon mm -hmm. this is when jeremiah and such is going to be written so this is the exilic period right mm -hmm. and then you would say or would you say that kind of that next stage of judaism to understand would be the post-exilic is that important to understand or do you absolutely yeah. right so that's you know 587 years well so you're, we're about 587 586 bc temple mm -hmm. gets destroyed and then um, 516 is when the second temple is built so during that period uh, is it 538 they return right so you have this period of you know maybe half a generation geographically isolated so you have the, the pre-exilic period and, and the exilic period itself is actually um, in terms of, is there a faithful remnant in Jerusalem? The exilic period is actually pretty short. But one thing that's important to remember is that in that post-exilic period, not everybody comes back. So you have Jews remaining in Babylon and in Persia at that time. And it's this type of Judaism that grows out into a religion that says, hey, we don't have sacrifices anymore. What do we do? And so people start to gather together um, there's some Greek influence to, to jump way ahead. You have Alexander the Great mm -hmm. who introduces the Greek language. And so gathering together in Greek is synagogue. That's where you get synagogues, right? Uh -huh, so this okay. is existing. So, um, to fast forward again, really fast, when the second temple gets destroyed in the year 70, you have this whole developed religion in the East of Judaism that doesn't, that is aware of the temple, but has developed a system apart from, uh, apart from the sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very word-based, preach, uh, preaching-based, and you have these two oral traditions. This is how Judaism is structured today of the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. And virtually any rabbi you talk to will say that the Babylonian Talmud is more authoritative because okay. it's, it's been this developing oral tradition since the exilic period. Okay, so you've got the exilic period, 70 years, right, where you've got some that were brought into Babylon, some mm -hmm. remain in Jerusalem. Right. And you're saying that even after that 70 years, right, a lot of the Jews get sent back to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And now at this point, you've got kind of two storylines is what you're saying. Yes. There's the Jews that have stayed in Babylon and they're forming their own religion, which is completely void of any temple. So they can't do mm -hmm. sacrifices. Exactly. Right. Because as an aside, you know, maybe we can dive into this later, but like you did the sacrifices at the temple. Like, yeah. You had to do your sacrifices in your backyard. Exactly. Like, you had to do it at a location, which is very important in the book of John. Yeah. Right. Plug, plug right. Dr. Yes. Weinrich, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so you, these growing up in Babylon, they are, their religion is now formed without a sacrificial system. Mm -hmm. So what defines them then you're saying is kind of their, their moral structure and teachings. Yes. Okay. So that's where we really get what we would call to the beginnings of what we would call today Judaism. Okay. So, um, rabbinic Judaism really starts during the exilic period when, when you have these teachers trying to reconcile. We're, we're geographically isolated from where we're supposed to be. Our temple is destroyed. How do we live? And, you know, then you look at Judaism, I mean, in 2023, right? Um, that's what most of Judaism is now, mm -hmm. right? Is, is outside of the land of the land of Israel. Yeah. Without, they're not doing much. They're not doing sacrifices. And yeah. Right. Like There's still yeah. no temple today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's grown up there. Um, and you can kind of make sense of it, right? Like, to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt, like mm -hmm. they're they're there in this other, and they're, try, they're trying to be loyal to God. They can't yeah. do these things. They, they really can't do these kind of sacrifices. So they have to kind of create a structure void of that. Yeah. I mean, think about American Christianity in 2020, right? All mm -hmm. of a sudden, you can't go to your geographic place where the, the sacramental, liturgical, sacrificial reality is being enacted. And there's a lot of people who sort of invented a new religion where it's like oh we actually don't need those that stuff anymore right like yeah. you just need to to pray in your own house and that's good enough right mm -hmm. and that sort of good enough for now um turned into a codified religion for so many people yeah, right there are a lot cool. of people who still you know three years into this don't haven't gone back to church because 
you know, I now have my, you know, synagogue mm -hmm. <laughs> a apart from the, the liturgy of Jerusalem. So an exception to the rule grows to become a rule. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So that's going on in this Babylonian Judaism, yeah. Jews, you know, exiled and continue to be. But then you've got this remnant that returns to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. right? So you've got 500 and some years between this return, yeah. right? Nehemiah, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the other big players? Ezra. Ezra, yeah. Yep. So they, they come back. And they rebuild the temple, sort of, right? Yeah. So then what's going on with that group of Judaism that's located back in Jerusalem in that time period? Yeah, right so this is, this is the crew that says, hey, um, God didn't order all of these things without a reason. Let's go back. And one of the, I mean, it's, it's comical in a way, but it's heartbreaking in a, in a way too. So when, when they build the temple, um, so many people break out in, in tears and they're weeping because it's not as good as the first one, mm -hmm. right? They, they remember the glory of the good old days. And again, I think this is a thing that a lot of Christians can sympathize with. There is a nostalgia for, you know, the sort of pre Vietnam Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, churches were full on Sundays and, you know, everybody went to the Mon Pa stores. This is what people are, are remembering as they rebuild this temple. So this is where you have this rediscovery of the law, this reintroduction of the, of the temple sacrifices, because, I mean, you have to, right? God commanded these things. And, and so part of the reason that the exiles return is because Babylon loses power and Persia starts to become, or does become, the world power. Persia is, they're, they're the empire to mess with now. And so... Everything seems to go back to normal. And this is where if we're only reading the Bible, which there's nothing wrong with only reading the Bible, but that's where history kind of drops off. So we have um, some of it in, in Chronicles, uh, mm -hmm. tells the, the post-exilic history a little bit. We have, um, you know, the prophet Malachi is the last prophet. Um, but then during this, this exilic period is also when you have... Um, so you obviously you have scripture still being written, like in the book of Daniel, but mm -hmm. then in this return, you have this retelling of the story. So that's where you get, I mean, think about Chronicles, right? It is a retelling of the book of Kings, books of Kings. And uh, if you can think of um, Deuteronomy as a retelling of, of Leviticus and Numbers in a certain sense. Yeah. So you have this idea of, um, if I can jump way ahead now, right? What is, uh, Lewis calls it mythopoeia, right? The making of a myth. Yeah. Right. And, and when I say myth, I'm not saying that the Bible's not true. Right. Wait, but wait, that, do you want to talk about C.S. Lewis today? Yeah. Oh boy. We're going to be here for a while. <laughs> That's right. The sun's down. <laughs> yeah. So it's a party now. So you have this idea of, we have to retell the story. Um, and this is, I mean, this is what preach Christian preaching is, right? Mm -hmm. We, we retell, you know, we'll say the gospel lesson for the day from the pulpit. And of course, you you retell it with application, with um, sometimes with stories, with different things. And as you retell it, these stories grow and they change. So um, about this time too, you have this growing influence of, of the Greeks. Um, they're just a bunch of city states. They're not really a, a formal empire at this point. But as as a Greek is, is spreading influentially, you have um, Jews that are well. So Jews are now speaking Aramaic, the Babylonian language. Hmm. Hebrew sort of becomes the religious language. Mm -hmm. So you think about um, Latin in maybe the 17th or 18th century, right? It's this churchly language, but then everyday business is kind of done in French or German or English or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's the same. So Hebrew is the temple language, the synagogue language as well. Aramaic is the, the conversational language. So it's a little bit of timing. Mean, we're going to do a bit of a jump. So 332... I think, mm -hmm. is when Alexander the Great starts to conquer everything. So he defeats the Persians and uh, we get all of these different stories coming out of what happens when Alexander comes to Jerusalem. So there's different versions of it. Um, some people will say that Isaiah 19 is actually a prophecy of Alexander the Great okay. uh, coming from the West to, to you know help God's people. You have uh, Josephus and some other historians tell this story about when Alexander the Great gets to Jerusalem, he makes a sacrifice to I am, to Yahweh, okay. and all of this stuff. So then you have this weird thing of like, can a Gentile have faith? Yeah. <laughs> right? And so you're, you're getting these different versions of the story that are always made to sort of magnify these characters. Um, one of the best examples is the book of Daniel. So written in the exilic period, 
And the book of Daniel is cool because it's a mix of Hebrew and Aramaic. Mm. Um, but when it gets translated into Greek, some of these uh, tacked on oral traditions get inserted into it. So one of the best ones is uh, Bell and the Dragon, which is cool. I mean, it's a dragon, right? Yeah. Like you should, you should go read it. Yeah. There's the story of Susanna, which is an, a really cool story about how Daniel is this mastermind lawyer as well that sort of exonerates this woman of of charges of being a, a loose woman. Um, there's one story that talks about when Daniel's very hungry. And so an angel picks up the prophet Habakkuk by the hair, who's in Jerusalem, carries him <laughs> over to, to Babylon because Habakkuk had just made soup. And so he drops him off, he gives soup to, to Daniel, and then the angel carries <laughs> Habakkuk back. Yeah. So you have stuff like this, which aren't, they're not well attested. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of literature, they're not unbiblical, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not ridiculous to think that an angel would carry somebody, mm -hmm. you know, 2000 miles or whatever it is, but you have this retelling of scriptures. So then the same thing happens as fewer people speak Hebrew, the Bible gets translated into Aramaic. And as that happens, you have these huge insertions of stories. So, um, there, these are called the Targums. You, okay. can, you can find them on, so safaria, S-E-F-A-R-I-A dot org is this awesome resource of, of Jewish material. But the Targums will have these inserted stories. So here's an example of what the Targums are doing. So when uh, the angels, they always sing the song, Holy, Holy, Holy from mm -hmm. Isaiah. And so they're singing Holy, Holy, Holy one day. And then they look down and they see Adam. And they start singing holy, holy, holy to Adam because they mistake him for God. Because he's made in the image of God. Exactly, right? Yeah. This is this is pre-Christian. Yeah. Right. Which is so cool. Yeah. Um, you have this other one where Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac, and Isaac says, uh, bind me tighter, father, so that I can, you know, so that I'm not trying to wiggle away because I need to be sacrificed. Yeah. And the angels are are talking back and forth and they're like, What's he doing? You know, most people would fear, but here this one is stretching out his neck to be sacrificed, you know? So there's these these uh, you know, I would I don't want to say non-Christian, but pre-Christian mm -hmm. uh Israelites, Jews, who are reinterpreting scripture in a way that sounds very Christian. So when you say reinterpret, you mean you don't mean like they're trying to come up with a new religion but they're looking right. back on these stories right and they're understanding the like the theological implications and teachings and therefore they're doing like you said like what we might do in a sermon we're not mm -hmm. we're not going to go back and rewrite a parable exactly you know but we might be able to apply the parable and its theological implications to our modern day situations right. so for instance when they're when they're talking about adam you're, you're mentioning this is pre-christian because of mm -hmm. course Paul is going to talk about Christ as the new Adam, yeah. right? And these importances, right? So they're they're catching on to, I think your point is these themes, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, th that we as Christians would even pick up on these themes, like yeah. old Adam, new Adam, right? right? Christ is the new Adam. So, um, right, so you're kind of defining that they're, are they, how would you define what they're doing like here at this time? Like they're, are they, uh, are they becoming more theologically in tuned? Are they wrestling with like the, philosophical and like implications of these things. Is that what they're doing at this time? Absolutely. So there's, it's definitely, I would say they're just engaging in a theological reading of scripture. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's this great temptation, um, you know, and it's, it's not altogether bad, right. To fear over allegorizing or over spiritualizing. Um, but you can't just read, uh, you just mentioned our professor, Dr. Weinrich, right. Mm -hmm. he, he would always say, don't read the Bible two dimensionally right? That yeah. you have to understand it as this whole, uh, narrative and these, um, th these Jews, you know, it's more like poetry than a commentary. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. Poets, what's the line? Poets lie by telling the truth. Poets tell the truth by lying or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and so they're not saying, Hey, this actually happened, right? Um, an angel, saying the Sanctus to Adam, right? But they're saying it is, it is as though, right? Mm -hmm. So Martin Luther does this all the time uh, when he'll, he'll start to explain a passage and then he goes, it is as though our Lord said, right? And so he actually does this. Um, it is as though, you know, I, so as a, as a contemporary example, last Sunday I preached on Jesus healing the deaf mute, right? So he, he puts his ear or his fingers in the ear and his ears are loosed. He touches his tongue and his tongue is loosed, right? 
how can how can a preacher not make this connection of you know the body of christ touching your tongue mm-hmm. allowing you to proclaim his glories right mm-hmm. now i'm not saying that jesus you know <laughs> communed the guy right. in doing that but when you're drawing out that poetic thing you're 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 seeing the wheels turn. Right. And I think one of the problems is that if one of these Targumim, one of these interpreters says, you know, the angels were singing the Sanctus to Adam, eventually that becomes codified in, in the Targums. Or, as if it's as if it's history, not as if it's a story teaching a theological truth. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which is why um, not long after Jesus, some of the rabbis will actually say, don't read these Targums. I think especially the Targum on Job, it's like, don't even touch it because there's way yeah. too much in there, Yeah. right? And, you know, there's no no better way to increase sales than banning a book, yeah. right? So everybody loves to read this stuff. Um, but you have these expansions. Sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just... Well, I think, yeah, I think one thing that's really helpful. So one, one right, you're like, you're painting this picture of Judaism as it's kind of trying to redefine its identity after mm-hmm. it's really lost its golden age, right? Yeah. With the with the temple, with the sacrificial system, all this kind of stuff. And you're saying at least one of the pros, right, is that they're now really wrestling with these scripture texts yes. and they're thinking theologically. And the great connection for us is, because one thing you said that that reminded me of something Weinrich talked about was during this time period, the most important story, he said, maybe I'm, you know, hopefully I'm 90% accurate. I don't want to dare take him out of context right. here, but I do remember him talking about just very recently Um, how one of the most important stories was the story of Isaac. And the point was exactly what you were saying in kind of that that codified story, that Isaac's willingness to be sacrificed, they connected to the Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant. Mm -hmm. So it was was of chief importance theologically about this Isaac who was willing to be sacrificed, just like the suffering servant. Now, we as a Christian put those two together and we'd say, this is just, it's laying a very firm foundation yeah. for everything that Christ is going to fulfill, mm-hmm. right? But it, as you're talking, it seems to me that during this time period, they're wrestling with and starting to come to terms with some of these ideas that are gesturing towards the incarnational yes. truth that comes, which is which is helpful to see them kind of moving towards an understanding of something. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, you know, imagine if you're raised your whole life with this, you know, very liturgical, we'll call it Judaism. And, you know, the scriptures are there, they're read because you're supposed to read them. Um, But you're told, you know, the Lord is one, you shall have no other gods, the Lord is one, the Lord is one. And then uh, one day you you, you open your scroll or whatever, and you read, let us make man in our image, right? What do you do with that? Mm -hmm. You have this this multiplicity within a a singular Godhead. Mm -hmm. You you have to do something with that. Um, And throughout this period of of Judaism, you have, yeah, this, this anticipation of, uh, of what we would call incarnation. So this uh, Jacob Neusner, who um, I think he died like 10 years ago, he's sort of the guy on rabbinic Judaism. If you look up his Wikipedia page, I forget. He's he's like, he's published like 200 books or something. Ben, ben is on it. Look, yeah. He's ready to go. And, and N-E-U-S-N-E-R. But uh, in one of his books, which is called... Uh, so Jacob Neusner? Yeah, yeah. N-E-U-S-N-E-R. Strapping gentleman. Oh yeah, from Hartford, Connecticut, That's was right. an American academic scholar of Judaism. He was named as one of the most published authors. Nine hundred. Yeah, nine yeah, yeah. Nine hundred books. It's count. wild. So my actually my I wrote a nine page paper once. <laughs> <laughs> one of one of my professors at the University of Wyoming actually studied with him, and uh, he donated a bunch of his books to the University of Wyoming, mm-hmm. but nobody was doing Jewish studies, so they weren't in circulation. So they all went to the book sale. So I have a bunch of Neusner books that I got for like 50 cents a pop, which is wow. great. But when he's, uh, he, he has a book on the incarnation. Uh, it's called, I think it's called the incarnation of God or something like that. But he even uses the word consubstantial to describe God and man. And this is, this is a, a Jew, right? A, a yeah. non-Christian Jew writing in the 21st century, you know? Well, what's he, what's he gesturing at there? So he's, he's just trying to say that uh, Christianity is not this huge break in the tradition because God mm-hmm. becomes man, mm-hmm. right? So ultimate, ultimately at the time, the Jewish rejection of Jesus, you know, 2,000 years ago was that he's not the Messiah, not that he couldn't be the Messiah, but that he, simply that he wasn't. Yeah. 
can, okay, are we ready to drill into now like the, the type of Judaism that, that Jesus is going to interact with? Sure. So let's go a little bit more with Alexander. Okay. Yeah. Because I want to drill on just, just so I don't forget so I can say it out loud because I want to revisit this. But that point you're making about uh, Christianity is not, especially for Paul, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we can maybe hone in on that. For Paul, Christianity is not a new religion. Christianity yeah. is 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 true Judaism. Right. Right. Or you know, that's not the word to use, but well, you understand what yeah, I'm saying. Exactly. Like, this yeah. is what has been anticipating for, not, oh, I've always been wrong, and now my mm-hmm. my entire paradigm has shifted, but yes. here is that which fulfills everything that we have sought after. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, step yeah. back. So, yeah, so we'll go back a little bit. So, Alexander the Great is great, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, he conquers everybody. He's actually, he's a very, very benevolent leader. His kingdom goes from Macedonia all the way to uh, Afghanistan, maybe a little bit into modern-day India. So his teacher, we have have Socrates right here. So Socrates teaches Plato. Plato teaches Aristotle. Aristotle is the tutor of Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great is um, bringing Aristotelian philosophy to India 300 years before Jesus is born, right? And so now Judaism, which stretches from Jerusalem to modern day Iran, is now interacting with this Greek... Uh, philosophy. So now Judaism, not only, uh, especially in the diaspora, is not only saying, how do we work apart from a temple, but how do we work apart from a temple? And now we're reading this guy called Plato, who sometimes sounds very much like like the Bible does, Aristotle. And by by di- diaspora, you mean those Jews that are still in that yeah, Babylonian Persian exactly. yep. area. Yeah, those guys who never they came never back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have, I mean, um, in, in the Babylonian Talmud, there are sort of whole chunks of, of, you know, citations of Homer, which is kind of cool. So you're, you're reading Greek in Hebrew script. <laughs> and so oh, as wow. you're reading it, sometimes you kind of stumble and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. And then mm-hmm. you realize you're reading Greek yeah. in a non-Greek alphabet. It's wild, right? So, so the Jews are interacting with this too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'd mentioned the Bible gets translated into Greek about this time. There's a lot of traditions around it. Uh, we don't have to unpack all that, but one of the yeah, yeah, right. Is it is it perfectly translated by these seventy or seventy two? Is it not? Who knows? But one of the things that happens a lot. So whereas, you know, in the Bible, it, it's common to read, you know, God said to Moses, and in the Septuagint, the Jews are now kind of bristling. Some of the Jews are bristling against this idea of God being so close to us. Hmm. So now it's the word of God spoke to us. Mm. So you can't have God speaking directly. You have to have some sort of mediator, uh, which is definitely an influence of Plato. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I'll say it this way. It's a collision of Plato and the Bible. Mm -hmm. Um, Platonism gets a bad rap in Christianity as though it's this thing that wrecked us. It's good. (laughs) Like Platonic Christianity is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So Alexander dies. Uh, The whole thing goes into a mess. There's a split between the... uh, Ptolemaic and the Seleucid empires, they fight. Long story short, eventually um, the Jews in Jerusalem start to say, hey, we we don't really like the way the Greeks are ruling us. Uh, A king comes to power who says, don't be so Jewish, you guys. And he introduces all of these Greek things, part of it being the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. So when you're learning, um, part of learning is being physically fit. So you're wrestling in Greek culture, you wrestle naked. Uh, Jews look weird when they're naked because they're <laughs> circumcised, right? And all these oh, Greeks yeah. are saying, "What? Is, what is this? What's going on?" So again, I don't want to be too crass, but you know, in this time period, uh, Jews actually invent a system to reverse circumcision, so really? that they can fit in, they can mm-hmm. look like everybody else. And so it always starts with just a little, a little twist of "Don't be so fake." Were you about to Google that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bennett, don't search any pictures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. So, so you have this like a little bit, right? Okay. Well, we just won't circumcise anymore. Is it really that big of a deal? We just won't, you know, um, pray on, on the Sabbath anymore. Is it really such a big deal? Mm -hmm. And so slowly, uh, if I can speak this way, slowly the government encroaches on what the church is supposed to be doing and not doing. Mm -hmm. And then one day people wake up and they say, this isn't even the real religion anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you have this Jewish revolt. Uh, things get really bad. Antiochus ends up, um, desecrating the temple he changes um, the altar in the temple to an altar to zeus yeah and then uh sacrifices pigs on it so like you can't be more unjewish than that yeah worship zeus sacrifice pigs 
Uh, then there's uh, a great yeah. war. There's a reclamation. The Jews take it back. Um, it's still a, a is this the Maccabee and yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. So this is first and second Maccabees, which, which by the way, I mean, just, just to make a little plug here, yeah. you know, Lutheran should read first and second Maccabees. Man. Is that fair? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the, I, I would say that's not that the Catholics don't have ownership on. No, first and no, second Maccabees. absolutely not. The, the greatest if I can say that the greatest th uh, resource that Concordia Publishing House has is it's called, I think it's just called the Apocrypha Lutheran edition or something yeah. like that. And it's great. It has a bunch of introductory essays. Uh, if you really want to geek out, just look at the people who reviewed it at the front. You know, you always have that blurb of this is a great book. Just Google those names. So many of them are like the who's who mm -hmm. of second temple Judaism. Some of them not Lutheran. I think a lot of them not Lutheran, right? Big deals are saying this is a good resource. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, read it. I mean, there's a difference between reading something devotionally and reading something, right? And and obviously you have to be a little more on edge, right? To say, hey, is this, uh, I was about to say, is this kosher, right? That's a poor <laughs> choice of words, right? But, you know, is, is this a legitimate way of reading history? Yeah. So Maccabees is one of the best examples. So you read first Maccabees and you're like, cool. And then you read second Maccabees and it's like a little bit more dramatic retelling Radio, of everything. Okay. There you get the story of the seven sons, the mother and the seven sons. Yeah. One, one's like killed one after the other. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, it's, yeah. it's much more romantic and dramatic. Mm -hmm. And so you see that Greek influence too of, of the Greek uh, tragedians who are, who are writing these great plays. Mm -hmm. So you have this Jewish history and then it's like, okay, let's make it a little bit better. Then you have third Maccabees which isn't really third Maccabees. It's more like a philosophical retelling of what life was like under the Ptolemies. And then you have fourth Maccabees. And I think that's the one where you get like elephants are part of this war in okay. the siege, right? So things are just getting more and more. Um, and then way later in Judaism, you get the story that when the Jews retook the temple, the, uh, the oil lasted for eight nights, right? And that's where you get uh, modern Hanukkah. But okay. that's, that's not even during the Maccabean period, that's way later when people start to speak this way. Okay. Um, Josephus mm -hmm. is a contemporary probably with like St. Paul, a little bit later than St. Paul. When he retells the Maccabees, he doesn't mention anything about the oil. Mm -hmm. So at this point, this is uh, 167. We'll say that okay. <laughs> about Something. that time that, uh, that, that the temple is restored. And so this is where you kind of have this pinnacle of Second Temple Judaism. So now people are taking a step back. They're like, okay, we've had bad priests and not only bad priests, we've had pigs sacrificed in our own temple. Like we got to figure this out. And this is where you really start to see a splintering of Judaism. So you have some people who go out into the desert around the Dead Sea um, and they form what they call the Yechad. So the, the community, this is where you get the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it's a very close knit ascetic community. You have some people who say, all right, let's just lock it down. You got to be, you got to believe the Bible. You have to believe all of the oral traditions as well. These people eventually get called the Pharisees. You have some people who are like, hey, let's, let's not go too far. Let's believe the Bible, but just the five books of Moses and none of that weird stuff about like angels or the resurrection. These are called mm -hmm. the Sadducees. You have some people who are just, I mean, they're almost anarchists, right? So they have the, their, their identity as Jews is, you know, we don't like the Persians. We don't like the Greeks. We don't like the, eventually we don't like the Romans, right? These are called the zealots, right? So their religion was is, that, was that, uh, which disciple was a zealot? Yeah. So Simon is called the zealot Yeah, and there's some debate about it. Are they just saying he's really, you know, on fire for the Lord or is he a part of part this of political party? party? Yeah. Um, you know, these were like people who would incite riots by carrying knives into crowds and just start stabbing people. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, the guards would have to come and fix it and then you'd have a riot. So have you watched The Chosen? No. Okay. So they they hit the, their portrayal of him is really. Okay. Yeah. It, it's really appealing, I would say. But they, they kind of play him off as kind of this almost like Jewish CIA agent, right? Like oh, he's just okay. very well yeah. trained in martial arts and stuff yes. like that. And he's he's basically going to go off on this mission that he's supposed to go assassinate someone da, 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 da. And then, you know, what do they do? I think they played off at his brother's the one that's healed at the pool of Siloam. So they play, that's I mean, so, cool. so they're adding yeah. things in, but it does kind of, and then he watches that happen. He sees Jesus and then he mm -hmm. stops his, his mission basically abandons it and ends up following Jesus. So obviously there's, there's extra curricular things yeah. added in there, but 
they do kind of portray if he was an actual zealot, what that might have looked like. But I think that's a great example of a theological and historical reading of the text, Mm. right? So, you know, and I think this comes out clear in TV shows or movies because you're like, okay, Simon the Zealot, if you're preaching on it or doing a Bible study, you can say, eh, some people think this, some people think this and move on. But in a movie, like you have to take a stance. Mm-hmm. And so I love it when, when they do stuff like that. Or, you know, in, um, in Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there's so many creative moves there that are just brilliant. Can I say, tell you what my favorite one is? Yeah. So uh, I won't tear up doing it now, but this is one of those rare things that like just gets me every time. But it's, uh, it's the way that he portrays Mary. Is this right up your alley too? Oh, I, I think we're going to say the same scene, but yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So he, uh, so Jesus last interaction with Mary, right. Is when Mary's running to Jesus and she keeps, she keeps seeing him as a child, mm-hmm. right. Falling. And yes. it's just, that's the most emotional scene. Like mm-hmm. I can't keep it together ever when yep. I watch that scene. Right. And then he, she gets to him and he goes, look, mom, I make all things new. Yeah. So that they, they pull, Jesus says that in the book of Revelation mm-hmm. and they pull it out and they put it in, in on Good Friday. No, it's, br- that's a theological reading of that's scripture. Good theology. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's my, that absolutely. That's the best part. But it, I think it even gets better because the next scene that you see Jesus and Mary together is, and this is a Mel Gibson, you know, Catholic. So he's yeah. going to have a pretty good, um, he's going to, he's going to have a high view of the sacrament. So it's right after Jesus has died. Yes. And Mary goes up and she kisses Jesus' feet. Mm-hmm. And then she looks at like the camera and it's zooming out and she's got Jesus' blood on mm-hmm. her lips. And Mel Gibson's saying, this is what this whole thing is about yes. so that the blood of Christ can be placed on his own mother's lips mm-hmm. in order to make all things new. Well, and it's and that whole scene is overset with sort of a flashback to Thursday night when he's instituting the supper, yeah. right? Which is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, just like, and you're saying this is even what they're doing in that second temple period to some degree yeah. is that they're, they're wrestling with these theological things, right? Right. And so I think, you know, we, we should also think of, so again, Weinrich, right? Are you going to have him on this? Yeah. Good. Yeah. He's, he's great. So he would always tell us too, the Bible, of course, the Bible is more than literature, but it's certainly not less. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we should think of the new Testament as part of that second temple milieu. Mm-hmm. And so when, when, you know, when Jesus, I mean, I mean, he's preaching right around the the Passover and somebody starts to talk about manna in the wilderness. And then he starts talking about his flesh and his blood. That's a theological reading of the, the manna in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. I mean, Paul does it. Uh, we all ate the same spiritual bread. We drank from the spiritual rock, which is Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, the book of Hebrews does it over and over again. Uh, Jude does it. Um, I don't want to jump ahead too much, right? But but Jude is actually quoting some of these non-biblical Second Temple uh, documents. So in, in the Second Temple period, you have some people expanding scripture, and then you, some things are just rewritten sort of with, with biblical characters cast in them. So probably the most famous is Enoch, right? Mm-hmm. So we have that one line in the Bible, Enoch walked with God and then was no more. Mm-hmm. And why wouldn't someday somebody was like, hey, well, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. And, you know, stories grow into stories and eventually you have this like whole cosmic vision of everything. And and can you explain how this is different? What you're talking about here is different than if someone like added to the book of Matthew, right? Because that's not what's going on here. Because we would say obviously to add to or to take away yes. would be, you know, a very cheap sin against the Holy yeah, Spirit, right? right? Crime against humanity. Mm-hmm. That's not what they're doing here, right? Like if you said... I'm going to add a couple chapters to Matthew to expand on some of these theological principles. Is that what they're doing here? I don't think they're doing it with any sort of, well, I I think there's different sort of authors, you know, whoever inserted these stories about Daniel, which, Mm -hmm. so they're in that apocrypha, right? If you open your English standard version Bible to Daniel, you're not going to read about dragons, Mm -hmm. but in the apocrypha, you know, you, you will have that. I don't think anybody's saying the Bible's not good enough. Let's add more to it. You know, stories grow over time. And eventually they become sort of part of the, the narrative. Um, I mean, think of one example, right? That there were, there were animals at Christ's birth, mm-hmm. right? It's just, it's not there. It's not in the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. But we've been sort of inundated with art to think that. Now, there's nothing wrong with believing that. But if somebody changes the book of Matthew to include, and there were camels and a little drummer boy playing his drum, you know, mm-hmm. then we're like, yeah, that's wrong because you're adding to what 
the Holy Spirit has said. Yeah, but you watch that little drummer boy, the king and country. If you yeah, see that one, yeah. like that, it's beautiful. Exactly. Oh my right? gosh, why? Because they're they're painting this picture. What are the theological truths mm-hmm. that are coming out of Christmas? Right. And once again, they're not trying to change the biblical story. Yeah. And that's where a lot of people react against them, and they get kind of angry about that. And it's like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. Like understand the the beauty of the theological appreciation of this event that's taking place here, and especially right. people are using good art and good beauty in order to portray that. Yeah, I mean, again, again, you know, is is Jesus reinterpreting the manna in the wilderness? I mean, yeah, yeah he is. Overtly. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and so we shouldn't be afraid to do that, you know, homiletically, poetically, artistically. Mm-hmm. Now, if this, you know, and, and there obviously when, when Paul says all scripture is breathed out by God, he's he's speaking in such a way guided by the Holy Spirit, right? He himself is inspired. So that we're not always going to go chasing after everything else, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he tells Titus, right? Don't chase after Jewish myths. Is that Titus or Timothy? I always mix those two up. I yeah. don't even know. I can't remember which one was circumcised yeah. and which one yeah. wasn't. But. I just, I read the Bible so much, right? I get, That's right. <laughs> get them all mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, but, write that down, Bennett. Jacob likes to read his Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, so don't chase after Jewish myths. And I think part of that is he's warning against this because <sighs> like if you devote your whole life to reading and I've, you know, devote, I mean, I devoted like one master's degree to this, reading this stuff, right? You know, I don't know. Does it really help preaching and teaching that much? You know, I don't reference the book of Enoch mm-hmm. or the uh, the apocalypse of Moses or anything mm-hmm. like that. Now, they're, they're interesting historical documents, but there's a reason that they were never accepted by Christians or mm-hmm. Jews, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's good. So re- re- good to read. Remember to read them with at least a little bit of caution. Don't let them usurp the biblical. Yeah. Narrative. So I would say the Apocrypha is good to read. The Pseudepigrapha. Um, What's that? Yeah. So pseud- Apocrypha means the hidden writings. Um, so like the the Book of Revelation is the Apocalypse. So the the un unhidden mm-hmm. right the revealed. And so the Apocrypha they sort of get this name. Um, Roman Catholics will call it the Deuterocanon, mm-hmm. which I think is even more confusing. Yeah. Uh, so the Apocrypha just means. What it means now is this collection of books written between the Old and the New Testament that have some standing in Christian tradition, but we cannot assign to the same level of authority as as Scripture. The pseudepigrapha, so pseudo means false, and uh, graphe means writing. So these are they're called the false writings. So this is like the Book of Enoch. Mm. So this is written maybe a hundred years before Jesus. Some people date it after Jesus. Right. Definitely not fourth generation from or seventh from Adam. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not written by him. It's way later. Mm. It's a false writing. Um, The apocalypse of Abraham. Right. uh, Shows up in the third century in like old Slavonic or something. Right. Yeah. (laughs) This definitely wasn't written by Abraham. Sounds like the Gospel of Thomas and some of these other ones that come later as well. So so those those types of things. um, Gospel of Thomas would be more like hair, like completely avoid that. Exactly. Enoch. Would not be you wouldn't put that in the same. Yeah, I mean, you can sort of mine these these writings. So they become heretical in rabbinic Judaism, which okay. I think creates a temptation for Christians to be like, oh, that means we really like them, right? Right. And there there is this temptation to sort of push uh, the dating back a lot earlier. So we actually have documents that that are demonstrably changed by Christians. Mm-hmm. So um, the Apocalypse of Abraham is one where you have this whole section inserted later on where Abraham's like. I see, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, born of the Virgin Mary. It's like, okay, that's not how the prophets talk, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. this is a little too heavy-handed. Yeah. Um, so you, you you have these, you know, Christians are so desperately trying to legitimize their religion that sometimes they do just lie, right? Yeah. They change. And, you know, even changing a false writing is still a lie. You shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I mean, the pseudepigrapha, so you can find these two volumes by um, Charles Worth, the Old Testament pseudepigrapha. They're fun to read. Um, you can really get bogged down in some of the stuff. Some of the stuff is just weird. Mm-hmm. So there's one where, um, so Jacob and the angel are wrestling and then the angel is like, no, I'm actually um, the the leader of the heavenly choir. So I have to go back. And then Jacob's like, actually I'm Israel. I'm an angel. And then by the end, they're both angels. And so you have this like it's just weird, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's no benefit there. But the New Testament pseudepigrapha, I, I think, for the most part, just mark and avoid. So yeah, the yeah. Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the um, the infancy Gospel of Thomas especially, 
um, is, I mean, it's blasphemous. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the gospel of Thomas, and again, it's written in Coptic, which means it's a much later, uh, false Christian edition. So Mm -hmm. coming out of these heresies and stuff that, yeah, exactly. In Egypt, there's a big pod of, of heretics there. So where are we now? We up to Jesus yet? So we're up. Yeah. So let's, so so the reason we're talking about all this, right, is, is it's setting the stage because I think maybe one of the most missed points is when Jesus is dealing with like the Pharisees, for instance, Mm -hmm. right? What does that mean? And for the modern person, they probably like read that and they're thinking like, like a contemporary of David, Mm -hmm. right? Or, or, you know, what they're just, it's good to have a picture of this, these movements in Judaism. So you understand the arena that Jesus is primarily playing in when he's giving these teachings, when he's doing these miracles, all of these different things, right? So you Mm -hmm. put it in its proper context. Yeah. So Josephus, he's a first century historian. He's the one who actually unpacks this probably the clearest. So the New Testament, right? They just throw out the word Pharisee and you're supposed to know what that means. Mm -hmm. And um, in that context, everybody did know what that meant. Um, As we get further and further out, we have to rely on other historical documents to sort of fill in what that means. But what, what stands is that at the time of Jesus, there are disagreements. I mean, there, there's another, uh, the Samaritans have a different temple, right, mm-hmm. that they're worshiping at. There's, there's this Dead Sea community, probably um, it's, it's gone away by the time Jesus comes around, but at least their, their writings are still there. So, yeah, there's this huge diversity of Judaism, which I think is so important that it's not like there's this religion and then Jesus happens and then there's two religions. Yeah, yeah. There's at least five religions and then jesus happens and you have christianity but then you have all the false christianities too Mm -hmm. right yeah and you've got and is it fair to say that jesus is interacting are the pharisees the closest i think so i mean one so a lot of people will say that pharisees turn into rabbinic judaism um that's certainly a part of it I, i think we also just have to acknowledge that a lot of the pharisees become well the book of acts tells us that a lot of them become christians mm-hmm. because so the sadducees they don't believe in angels they don't believe in the resurrection so the whole jesus thing is just there's no common ground out, yeah. right um the zealots are they're trying to kill all the romans and jesus is saying pay your taxes and turn the other cheek mm-hmm. right so they're not gonna go with him uh, you have the uh, this different group we haven't talked about, the Ebionites, who are like, oh, well, Jesus um, was fully man who uh, who sort of appeared to be God or, or came to be God. And then okay. you have the inverse, too, of Jesus is fully God that only appears to be a man. Yeah. That's sort of the, the inverse. Those become kind of Christian heresies. Yeah, yeah. right. And so, so you have all of this uh, blowing up around the time of Pentecost. But, but it, to, to theologize history now, there's a reason orthodoxy wins out, and it's not because of this power struggle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this, this is like the, the Marxist reading of history is yeah. that Christianity as we know it won out because it was more powerful than the other ones, where we just have to say, it's true. And if you read you know, the false, so the, the, uh, the Acts of Peter, it's a fun read. I mean, at one point, a dog stands up on his legs and starts prophesying against Simon the Magician, you know? But like it doesn't, none of it fits, right? Mm-hmm. It's not, it doesn't feel like scripture. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, but I mean, uh, you know, my sheep hear my voice mm-hmm. and, and we do know that. And when you read the Apocrypha, it's great stuff, but, but you do know when you're hearing your shepherd's voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Christ comes, he's kind of, he, he's able to point out the fallacies that have risen up in these different versions of Judaism. Right. Um, shows himself to be that messiah which mm-hmm. as you're as you're saying as we're getting up to this point some of the jews that are trying to do theology with their scriptures are gesturing towards mm-hmm. right like what, what who's going to be this one like isaac who's yeah. going to willingly be sacrificed isaiah 53 on you know behalf of the people these prophecies in daniel that are talking about the messiah to come and it's actually giving dates that are getting yeah. around this time right and then christ comes and then the question is is he really is he really it yeah. You know, and then he dies. And then for a lot of people, the answer is, ah, no, mm-hmm. we got our hopes up. Right. It's like whenever there's like a movement in, you know, America and you're like, oh, things are going to be good. And then things get squashed. And you're like, right. oh, no, no, no. Right. So they've got kind of this. And then the resurrection ends up becoming this key debated point. Mm-hmm. Right. And then that's where I'm always interested in Paul's interaction because I, I always think, Paul, I never like, well, I shouldn't say that. I probably have taught this wrongly for years and, uh, N.T. Wright, I think, really, he was the author mm. that kind of 
switch this for me. And I very much buy this. And he says, no, no, no. The story of Paul is not Paul about Paul being a mean guy and then becoming a nice guy. Right. You know, the story about Paul is he's a zealous, dedicated Jew that wants to make sure that his people are ready for the coming of the Messiah and not do things like sacrifice pigs in the temple yeah. or undo circumcisions and all these kind of goofy things that a lot of these groups in Israel are doing. So he wants Israel to be operating as Israel is historically and biblically mm -hmm. supposed to be operating. So when he sees this Jesus and he thinks him to be a false Messiah, he's saying that's blasphemy to the highest degree. And therefore that's, that's a serious issue that has to be dealt with. He's wrong and he figures that out, mm -hmm. but it's not like always oh, a mean spirited guy. And then Jesus comes and right. turns him into a nice spirited guy. He says, no, he finally realizes Christ Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. And therefore, this is now that key that unlocks the meaning of all of these scriptures and all these gestures towards theology. Right. And that becomes the launching of this new kingdom. Like you said, it's not a new religion. It's mm -hmm. finally that key has been given to what we have always been anticipating. Or as Paul puts it, you know, we've been through now this childbearing period, mm -hmm. and now it's given birth to what Judaism was always meant to give birth to, which was this Messiah movement. Right. And that's, you know, it's, again, we, we always like clean breaks, um, you know, but I think that uh, homiletically, poetically, we can call Adam a Christian. <laughs> you know, we can mm -hmm. call um, maybe even some of the Maccabees, you know, we can call them Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Because they were they were faithful to God's word, mm -hmm. um, which is w faithfulness to God's word, even when the word becomes flesh, right? That, that doesn't really change mm. anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like the yeah. way of putting that, right? Because being loyal to God now means serving the Messiah, mm -hmm. serving his son, mm -hmm. right? Being loyal to God in 50 BC, you know, that didn't mean something different, but had a different right. connotation, right? There wasn't, you didn't yet worship Christ. You didn't know who he was. Now that you know who he is, now that's the defining factor of whether or not you're a loyal Jew or Gentile at this exactly, point. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know... Um, Seth, Adam's son, right, didn't go and worship on the at the temple, right, <laughs> right. So, so there's he didn't say the Apostles' this, Creed. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, right. So you have this growth, and I think one of the issues is that sometimes we're tempted to sort of take modern Judaism mm -hmm. and then reapply that to the early context. So you can find pictures of Jesus, you know, I mean, wearing a yarmulke with like the the curls, and and that's just that's bad history, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what Jews looked like two thousand years ago. Yeah. Um, I always like to tell people this, uh, especially around Easter, you know, so many churches want to do Seder suppers. The oldest Passover liturgy we have, um, well, it's certainly from the Old Testament, but apart from that, the oldest Passover liturgy we have is the institution narratives of the Gospels. Hmm. Right? So the the modern Passover liturgy, it's it's hundreds of years later. So you're saying what, what modern day Jews do mm -hmm. around the Passover? Yeah. We're actually more historically Jewish about what we do on Sunday. If you purely want to take it in terms of who has the oldest documents, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so when Christians are trying to say, hey, you know, let's have a Seder supper so that we can do, you know, sort of look at what Jesus did. Well, if you want to know what Jesus did on the night he was betrayed, guess what? <laughs> he Just took bread. <laughs> yeah. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave us to his disciples, you know. Um, there is this moment in the uh, the Passion of the Christ that I do like, though. So... Part of the modern Passover liturgy is a child will say, what makes this night different than any other night? And the father at the table will say, this is the night that we are delivered from slavery in Egypt. And uh, when Jesus is arrested in the Passionate Cuts and Mary Magdalene asks the mother of God, what makes this night different than every other night? And I think that's awesome, right? Oh, yeah. So that's like, you know, it's okay to plunder Egypt a little bit yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and take from the unrighteous. Um, but there's, you know, so many things within Judaism are, they are modern developments because so, so we should talk about too, the second temple gets destroyed, right? There's no yeah. temple in Jerusalem right now. So just of, of that anxiety of we're now in Babylon. So are we switching to, are we switching to modern day? Do you want to? Yeah. Sure. Is, I mean, is that kind of where you're going? I, yeah. 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 Because yeah, because now hopefully that history, I think that's essential, right? Mm -hmm. If you just jump to like what's modern day, yeah, you need to understand these movements, yes, right. And now we're getting to kind of from Christ to now, so that people today can try to make sense mm -hmm. of, you know, 
I don't know, maybe pick your Ben Shapiro or pick yeah, like your exactly. modern day Jew. Right. And then of course there's different camps and stuff there. Sure. Your, your synagogue, if you're on the East coast or if you're in that one spot in Wyoming. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think in Casper actually where we are, there, there's a, a synagogue. Okay. Uh, I know there's one down in, in uh, Laramie where I went to school. That's where I learned about Judaism was at the university of Wyoming. Um, cause I had a professor who was a, a religious Jew mm -hmm. and he would invite me to, uh, we still stay in touch to this day. He, he would invite me to, uh, to different festivals and stuff. And so it was fascinating to see, you know, how, how these, these liturgies grow over time. So one of my favorite ones is the festival of Purim, which sort of gets a nod in the old Testament, but it's not a big deal at all. And it's this motion. Now it's a motion of moving from sort of purity to impurity. And so the liturgy is you start with a glass of white wine and then there's like some readings or something. And then the next drink is like white wine with a little bit of red wine. And then you're just slowly transitioning to completely red wine. So by the end of the night, like, you know, you've had half a bottle of wine, right? Yeah. But you're moving from this in, uh, purity to impurity. Um, you know, the Passover Seder, it's about remembering in, in Judaism. It's about Mod modern day Judaism. In, in modern day Judaism. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's about remembering what happened. Um, but again, without any, any Christological understanding, right? So there's really, there's no messianic thrust to it anymore. It becomes totally allegorized to, you know, this is now how we're saved from the slavery of, I mean, take, take like any, you know, big box Christian preacher, right? Where, mm -hmm. where you sort of spiritualize everything to just a ridiculous degree. It's about living a resurrection life where you yeah. rise above the challenge. Yeah. As right, Christ you know, rose, you know. The, that's the typical one, right? You know, yeah. Jesus calms the seas of our hearts. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I'm not altogether opposed to, but like, you know, it can be just kind of dorky. Yeah. Um, but so, so again, so the first temple gets destroyed. You have this religion in uh, Babylon. What do we do without a temple? You have this growing... Then in Jerusalem, you have this other sort of semi-independent religion growing as well. The second temple gets destroyed. And then everyone says, hey, you guys have been doing this for a while. What do we do, right? Mm -hmm. How are we Jews without, um, without the temple? And so Paul is already addressing this, right? And he's writing before the temple is destroyed. So he actually uses the word Judaismos, right? Judaism. The only other time that shows up in ancient texts is in the book of Maccabees, I think it shows up once or twice, right? So Judaism in Paul's mind is a way of reading the Bible that doesn't see Christ as the telos. Mm. And part of that comes from the fact of a, of an incredibly, I mean, almost comically strict monotheism, right? Where God is God and he is holy and singularly, you know, this, this thing. Um, whereas, a, a true reading of scripture, you see that there is God, the father, that there is God, the word, that there is God, the spirit, that sometimes the angel of the Lord is actually the Lord, mm -hmm. right? So you have this very rich, um, you know, personhood that you're seeing throughout. And then Jesus, if there is any unclarity or, you know, confusion right before Jesus ascends, he goes, just so we're clear, when you baptize, do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, right? Yeah, yeah. This is who God is. The I am, it's me and my Father and the Spirit, uh, you know, hang on for 40 days. <laughs> You'll understand yeah. when he gets here. So that, I think, is, is one of the biggest things for Paul, right? So he sees two religions, uh, Judaismos, that is this idea of the Old Testament religion has nothing to do really ultimately with the Messiah. So it's a very white, you have to kind of go back and whitewash some of yes, these things, right? Absolutely. Because Judaism up until this point is very, it's an anticipatory mm -hmm. language or religion, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like us to some degree where we're saying there's going to be the second coming of Christ. Yeah. And if right. you pull that out, you get a very different, you know, mm -hmm. to them, that's even on a higher degree because they're saying there's going to be this coming Messiah yes. and these things have to take place and these prophecies need to be fulfilled. You're saying that this now new Judaism definitely post 70, but post mm -hmm. post Christ, they have to go back and kind of whitewash these things and take away the anticipatory focus, yeah. the Messiah focus. And even some of these, like where you get God, the word, God, the yeah. spirit, like these different things, they've got to kind of whitewash those things that have been there historically, mm -hmm. right. In order to deny Jesus yes. to, I mean, to be blunt, to create a new religion. Yeah. Because Jesus is the continuation of this. That's why Paul changes his mind, right? Paul says, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And he's educated too, right? At the Areopagus, I mean, he's quoting Epimenides and Eratus and all this stuff. Then he quotes Epimenides again to, uh, to Titus. And so he's, he's doing all of this stuff. So he's saying, I'm the one who's drawing from the full, 
human tradition. Yeah. <laughs> including the scriptures, right? Yeah. He obviously knows them back and forth. Whereas Judaism now is drawing from scriptures, but only as they're read through the the rabbis over in Babylon, mm -hmm. right? That they, they give this authoritative way of reading. Man, so there's a, I mean, as I think about that, there's something to the nature of Christianity that it adopts all things good from all areas mm -hmm. and takes it as its own. Yeah. Right. And not, it doesn't mean a fusion. It doesn't mean we'll take 30% yeah, right. Babylon or 30% Homer. And, yeah. but it's that the best that can be offered, even in, you know, from Socrates or yes. something like that. If it's true, it's got it. There's only one truth. Exactly. So it's got to come from God and it's going to find its telos and fulfillment in Christianity. Mm -hmm. So Christianity becomes an all encompassing, it becomes like light to where this Judaism that you're describing here actually has to start to shrink and yes. shrink and shrink like a Puritanism, right? Yes. Where it just, I mean, right. and that's, that's a sign of unhealthiness, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. And so you even have that, um, I mean, I always love it. So, so right. The God's people, they leave Egypt, they, they make a golden calf, right? And we sort of know the story, but we always have to ask, where do they get the gold? <laughs> They're plundering Egypt on their way out. Yeah. Right. And so we shouldn't be afraid to do the same of, of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Um, and then especially when you have the Holy Spirit moving St. Paul and, and St. Luke to record these pagan prophets. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's powerful stuff. So when uh, Paul says all Cretans are liars, it's from this poem where Epimenides says all, all Cretans are liars. And then he goes on to say, because they say that they have the tomb of Zeus but we all know that a God can't die. Oh. And so the all Cretans are liars is directly related to Christ and his resurrection. Yeah. Right. So, so, I mean, I want to circle back to this because this sure. is something I want to really want to deep right. dive with you because this is gold stuff. Yeah. I mean, well, at least it's a golden interest to both yeah. of us. Yeah, that's true. Um, right. Yeah. So, but, but to kind of wrap up this Judaism mm -hmm. picture, right. Um, what they've kind of whitewashed, things mm -hmm. this is happening already right after christ because they're responding to christ right so they're now starting to kind of change the very nature of their religion uh is that fair yeah i mean i, I would say that judaism so if it begins in the babylonian exile judaism certainly by so the temples destroyed in 70 the jewish revolt against the romans comes to an end in 135 and i think if you have to put you know a, a golden spike somewhere in the timeline 135 is where it is, where it's like, this is a different religion now. Mm -hmm. This is a new religion that's rooted in the temple can't be there anymore. And we no longer have, I mean, the temple was destroyed because God <laughs> tabernacled among men in the person of Christ Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. It's not this accident of history. Um, and, and we have to read it that way. But now you have to create a new religion that says, okay, well, Jesus wasn't it. And we don't really need the temple anymore. And prophecy ceased with Malachi, <laughs> and we have all this stuff to fill in, right? Mm -hmm. So of course you need oral tradition then. And th so what's going on today? Yeah, so I, I mean, you can asking a Judaism what asking asking a Jew what Judaism is is sort of like asking a Christian what Christianity is. Mm -hmm. But one of the biggest differences is that Judaism is is an external religion, and so you will you'll come across people where you can say. Um, you know, are you a Jew? And they'll say yes. And you'll say, are you religious? And they'll say yes. And you'll say, you know, do you, do you cover your head? Do you keep kosher? Do you, you know, refrain from work on the Sabbath? Do you do this? Do you, do you follow all these rules? And you say, yes, 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 yes. And then you can say, do you believe in God? And they'll say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's this, wow, it's a yeah. cultural understanding. And this is one of the biggest problems with, um, uh, post-World War II scholarship of the New Testament is, you know, and, and I'm not trying to downplay anything, right? The, the Holocaust is, is such a difficult thing to wrap our minds around, just not even as Christians, right? Just as humans. Yeah. And you read about World War II history, everything the Nazis did, and then you go back and you read the Gospel of John. And when you come across the Jews, you're like, oh, that sounds like kind of harsh, right? Mm -hmm. So what are we doing here? And it's, it's not, there is no anti-Semitism in the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Or in the New Testament. Right. So this idea of a Jew being both um, a religious Jew, uh, an ethnic Judean, right, and everything that encompasses today, it's so multiplied, right, that, that there is this, you, you can have a godless Judaism. You mm -hmm. can also have a very God-filled spiritual Judaism. Um, this is mostly 
I mean, if you think about like the, the big curls, right, that we call the, the Hasidim or the Haradim, the you see in like New York City or in the Holy Land, right? Mm-hmm. There's a very, you know, spiritual aspect of Judaism there. So they, they would believe in God. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And there are there's a very small um number of Jews that I would say are still functioning in that anticipatory model. But so there, there's a sort of a remnant in that way. Yeah. That are still awaiting a Messiah. But for them, they've got to come to terms with, like you said, things went black since Malachi. Yeah, exactly. Until now. So that's right. a really tough one to hurdle. So if you're talking to someone yeah. like that from a Christian perspective, it's like, maybe could we go revisit that? Like, mate, could it yeah. possibly be that that was the Messiah? Maybe you missed it. Mm-hmm. But those are, would you say those are probably the, I don't want to just, best i mean those are those are the most i don't know i mean i so martin luther towards the end of his life he writes this book on the jews and their lies you know it's it's a it's clickbait (laughs) title right if you read it it's it's certainly it's an angry writing and i'm not trying to excuse anything but but luther i mean he was an old testament professor and so i think he he genuinely had this idea that if he could just unpack the old testament christologically all the Jews in Germany would convert, right? Mm-hmm. And there would be no more Judaism. And I think to a certain extent, a lot of Christian authors, uh, thinkers, theologians have had that idea, right? It didn't work 2000. It didn't work for Jesus. It yeah. didn't work for Paul. It didn't work for uh, Luther, right? Um, so this podcast is not going to convert a bunch of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, more power to them, right? Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I never want to say that, I mean, the word of God does not return void, but, um, but that's part of, you know, having a religion and a culture sort of intertwined. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the greatest examples. So in my hometown, Worland, Wyoming, 5,000 people, there are three, uh, growing up at least, I think there still are three Lutheran churches, not in fellowship with each other. Mm. And, um, Mm -hmm. one of them was an independent Lutheran church. That was an old union church who for my entire lifetime has never had a Lutheran pastor. Mm -hmm. It's always been Southern Baptist preachers. Um, They stopped using the small catechism. They stopped using the liturgy. I think they stopped baptizing babies. But there's a huge remnant of people who are ethnic Germans. And so they're like, so our church is Lutheran. (laughs) Like it has to be a Lutheran church. And so if you have this idea of like, I'm a Jew because my mom was a Jew, then you don't necessarily have any beliefs tied to that or you don't have to have any beliefs tied to that. Mm -hmm. You, so, so some so there's th- those categories curly hair right there's that they're still believing in a god still waiting for the messiah there's th- that huge group that just says well, I'm, a, I'm a jew in the same way someone would say i'm a german exactly right and then there's kind of probably all this these groups in between where some will say like mm-hmm. as you said yeah it's important for me to keep this moral understanding yeah. that's the whole purpose of the old testament is for me to have a better moral mm-hmm. life do i believe in a god no because that doesn't apply to how i'm going to treat my neighbor right that infects christianity too you've got you've got that same issue sure, within Christianity, sure. maybe to, not to the same degree. I don't know. Um, yeah. Is that, does that kind of cover what modern day Judaism looks like? I think so. I mean, yeah, like you said, it's, it's multiple. So one of the, my favorite stories about how diverse Judaism and Christianity is when, when I was on a, a study abroad in the Holy land, our tour guide, she goes, here's a fun game I like to play. She goes, every single person we see who's clearly you know, a, a holy man of some sort, whether he's a priest or a, a monk or a rabbi or something like that. She goes, I bet I can tell you not only what denomination he is, but what church or what synagogue he goes to. And I can guess within one or two, how many children he has. And so we played this game with her. She was spot on with all of them. Because, you know, if you see some like big old Armenian with a beard and his Armenian pectoral cross, he's like, okay, I know this guy. I know like whatever, what shoes he's wearing and all this stuff. So it was this totally external Christianity and Judaism Uh of this is who you are. This is what you look like. It'd be like if every Lutheran, you know, had a Luther Rose tattooed or whatever on on his forehead. Um, So Judaism, especially in the Holy Land, but I think everywhere, Uh it is just very much this external. So what are you doing? You know, um, if I, if I can just do say one more example, right? So the Old Testament law, um, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Don't right? eat cheeseburgers. Yeah, exactly, right? How <laughs> Sorry, do, did I say your punchline? No, okay. no, that, but that is the punchline, right? Yeah. How do you get from don't boil a baby goat in the milk of its mother to don't eat dairy and meat within six hours of each other, mm-hmm. right? It, it's that oral tradition, right? Sort of that barnacling of it. And so now to be a pious Jew, I mean, cause I would say if somebody says, I want to follow a moral law to love my neighbor, eat a cheeseburger, man. <laughs> like, like if, if really, if, if it's not about God yeah, and yeah. it's just about sort of being a, a responsible citizen, 
what's what's the harm you know yeah so if if there is no god why still do it and i mm-hmm. think it's just that that cultural idea yeah so that's a little bit of that coral reef too right like yeah oh definitely yeah yeah so i got some other things i want to talk to you about cool uh but well one is so you you've been entertaining the idea of going back for your doctorate's degree you've got two master's degrees mm-hmm Looking into doctorate's degrees, yeah. is that taken fruition at all, or what? Are you, yeah. What would you be studying? Yeah. So when when is this gonna go live? This episode? Uh, right now? It's, no, I don't oh. know. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. It'll be yeah. within. Um, well, yeah. So for viewers that are watching, we are planning. Well, we're gonna launch here soon. We're doing kind of bulk recordings here beforehand. Um, to give ourselves a little bit of a gateway as we kind of work through the marketing, okay. the release, all of that to build it up. So within six weeks, I'd say. Oh, Eight okay. Weeks. Okay. Then yes, it will come to fruition, but it has not yet. Okay. If you would have said that it's like, you know, March today, then I'd be like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So March 1st today. Yeah. So, uh, so, <laughs> so my interest, so my, my, uh, you say two master's degrees. So, you know, our, our seminary training, you get a master of divinity, mm. which always sounds like a Harry Potter degree to me, <laughs> but, right? So it's, it's not like a, a so many master's degrees, right? You know, our, our education was super course heavy, mm-hmm. right? It was three years in the classroom of like 120 credit hours. Yeah. Like it is, it is heavy. It's intense. Then I stayed uh, another year to get a master of sacred theology, which is a little bit lighter on the course load. It, the emphasis there is research, writing a thesis. Mm-hmm. So I have, you know, the practical degree and then I have an academic degree and, uh, it's been really good for me being in the parish now for a few years because I'm able to hash these things out. Right. So I love, you know, geeking out about second temple Judaism, but what I found really interesting is not just what are Christians doing in the first century, but just sort of how are God's people, especially modern Christ or especially Christians, I'll just say it that way, right? Post Jesus Christians. How are they reading things that aren't the Bible and Mm -hmm. applying them in in good ways, right? So, you know, again, Paul quoting these pagan philosophers, right? He's he's making a point by doing that. Um, You know, even the preacher who, you know, whatever, talks about Spider-Man or Batman in the pulpit. Yeah, yeah. Even though that's dorky, I think, you're still still engaging in a non-biblical text and trying to draw some sort of you know, my, my wife studied at a, at a Christian university and she had a theology professor who would do that, right? Jesus is, or Batman is like Jesus because he's the hero we need, not the hero. You know, it's just, it's corny, right? But mm-hmm. at least you're doing something, right? You're reading something and you're drawing this in. Well, it's like the importance there, right, is um, like, let's take like, like Schindler's List. I've used, you know, yeah, examples right. from that. Like, so the people that put together Schindler's List you know, are very qualified in their area of making movies and stuff, but they've got, I don't want to say an agenda in a bad way, but they've got things that they believe about the story of Oscar Schindler, about the implications of that on the hearer today that they're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Some of those things that might be, might could even be Christian in nature. Some of them might rhyme with Christianity. They might be really good teachings. And therefore what you're doing, if you're using that as an illustration, you're saying, here's, here's a really polished illustration that's getting across a point that has that is good Christian application. So mm-hmm. you're drawing that in. You're not saying Schindler's List, Bible, same thing, but you're just you're using that in that same way. So you're saying yeah. that's the way that these early Christians and such are approaching, not movies, because that's not there yeah. yet, but the kind of content that they that's prevalent at their time. Yeah, I mean, and because and there's, you know, you can find medieval Christian readings of, you know, Homer, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it's not this sort of crass allegory of, you know, whatever Achilles is like Jesus or something like that, but it's usually trying to draw out some sort of moral value or moral failure mm-hmm. of, of sort of what to avoid. I mean, the, again, the example that I like to use, maybe it's pretentious, right? I'm like, don't say anything about Spider-Man, but like you can quote Lord of the Rings in a sermon. Cause that's cool. Oh man. You know, does, <laughs> <laughs> does, so the question, right. Is the ring destroyed on March 25th? Right. And historically mm-hmm. you have to say no, right. Mm-hmm. There is no ring. It wasn't destroyed. Right. But the fact that it's destroyed on March 25th is huge mm-hmm. because Tolkien sees the incarnation as, as the, be- the final beginning of the end of evil, you know, and all this stuff. So, mm-hmm. so you have this theological reading of, of a fictional text, right? There is no such place as Middle Earth, right? Mm-hmm. It, doesn't, it doesn't exist. But there's no real need to emphasize that. Mm-hmm. You don't have to say it doesn't exist, mm-hmm. right? You can, you can draw sort of uh, a moral value from that. 
because that, that's a better example than like Schindler's List or Spider-Man, right? Because Tolkien is a very polished Christian. Yeah. He's a very polished uh, recipient of the West. Like he's, mm-hmm. he studied these kind of these classics. He studied these philosophies. He's very polished in his Christianity. And when he's creating his world, he's very adamant. I'm not doing allegory. Yeah. Right. So that's important. And what, what that would mean, I guess, for the hero is that um, would be a good example of allegory like uh pilgrim's progress or sure. something like yeah. that right where there's a character that's named like charity or something like mm-hmm. that and that character is the embodiment of charity and it's very overt that's not what tolkien is doing he's creating a mythology mm-hmm. right so he's creating a world it's not historically there's not actually middle earth mm-hmm. right there's not actually someone named bilbo but in these stories he's portraying good and evil as these things are battling out he's portraying virtue he's portraying heroes he's mm-hmm. portraying villains he's portraying the nature of evil and the advantage of someone like Tolkien is he's doing it with a well-polished Christianity as the information that's feeding this world that he's creating, right? So to study that, you're going to see beautiful poetic pictures mm-hmm. of Christi- Christianity in action or Christian virtues in action or, right. or all of these different things, right? Yeah, and, and in creating this new myth, um, he's actually entering into that Western canon that he's receiving, mm-hmm. um, and he's now participating in that, which is... Um, I don't want to be, you know, like sound like some old guy, you know, get off my lawn. But uh, that's one of the problems with, so this Amazon series, Rings of Power, did you ever watch it? Oh my gosh. Should we, should we geek out on how terrible that is? Yes. Yeah. And and I would say not only terrible, but actually evil. It's heretical. Exactly. And I'm not saying that because I like Lord of the Rings. So, I mean, I do. Yeah. But so Horus, he's writing in the first century in his Ars Poetica, and he's talking about decorum when you're writing fiction. So he's like, yeah, you can talk about Achilles if you're writing a new story, but it has to fit with the Achilles in all these other stories Mm -hmm. where you can write about Hercules and, you know, going back to the conversation on Judaism, uh, you can talk about Enoch or Moses as long as it fits with this previous telling. And in in sort of stealing Tolkien's lore, uh, Amazon has broke with Western decorum Mm -hmm. and, and they're now no longer representing those characters as as sort of the canon has represented them before so it's not only i mean yeah i would say it's actually um, heretical you know it's a sin maybe not against god but it's a sin against beauty and nature in sort of taking an established story and twisting it mm-hmm. um you know you think about some of the disney retellings of of fairy tales and i don't just mean the like in the last five years but in the last 50 years right mm-hmm. some of those retellings are just totally changing the story mm-hmm. yeah because the author that writes these has a reason that they're writing it Mm -hmm. and correct me if i'm wrong but before very recently let's just say maybe before like at least 1800 to be safe um when the people are writing these myths they're not saying i want to sell a lot of books and i want to entertain an audience right right. right? because that's not the books there's not book bookstores on every corner you know that's not how things used to work so when they're writing these they are trying to use the art of telling a story it could be mythology it could be like a philosophy or whatever let's just say a mythology they're creating this story in order to teach the good things that they've inherited. Mm -hmm. The things like strive after courage and taking shortcuts means long delays. It means that things are gonna go wrong for you. And they're playing these out in these beautiful stories. They're using their God-given talents Mm -hmm. in writing and creating and poetry and all of these things in order so that the reader can be further formed in this western tradition or you know this christian tradition so it's a it's a tool for formation towards the reader today that's not usually the main goal of Mm -hmm. tvs movies or even books it's just pure entertainment so that i can sell and then i can make money certainly that's amazon's overt goal Mm -hmm. and then you could even make an argument that they also have overt goals of actually steering the hearer away from this heritage and tradition of christian values and towards a new set of values so hence they take something like tolkien's beautiful whole middle earth lord of the rings and beyond all the silmarillion these other things he's written where he's trying to through his mythology teach and enter into this western Mm -hmm. tradition of teaching these wonderful things that people should strive after and that things should be things that people should avoid and amazon takes it and says I don't agree with anything that Tolkien believed and therefore I'm going to take his characters and I'm yeah. going to twist them and tell lies about them. And, and I think you have to say that that's part of the, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but you, you do have to say that's part of it because it was a billion dollars is what that series cost. I mean, it's not even a real number, mm-hmm. you know, and there's no way they made that back. No. In anything they've done. 
So, um, so there, there is this agenda and, and I'm not even trying to say there's this hidden agenda because you watch it and it's not very hidden. No. Yeah. Um, you know, the, um, uh, Greta Gerwig is doing the new Chronicles of Narnia series for mm-hmm. Netflix, you know, and yeah, exactly. Right. And I, I, I would love palpitations to be, when that comes out. <laughs> I know <laughs> I, I would love to be proven wrong, but you know, and this is, uh, so, so my, my current, uh, love right now is Edmund Spencer, who I just kind of stumbled upon. And he was a poet uh, during Elizabeth's reign. So end of the 16th century. So he, so you had said, you know, people aren't doing this to make money. Now th- there was a patronage system, right? So they're, they weren't always just these starving artists, right? They did survive, but, but Spencer, he, he writes, it's the, the fairy queen mm-hmm. and it's this beautiful poem. That's all. So all the parts are drawing out different virtues. So you have this Red Cross Knight who sort of turns out to be uh, St. George, right? Killing the dragon. And it's all drawing out different virtues. Yeah, like you said, his goal is that Christian readers will hear it or read it and walk away saying, I, I want to be like that, right? Mm-hmm. I want to overcome, you know, Sans Loy, right? He who is without the law. I want to be able to overcome this bad guy. Um, and, and even I would say, I, I think that's just the nature of, of fiction, right? So... You know, when I watch the newest Marvel movie, if nothing else, I'm stirred up to like go to the gym afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. you know, I, I want to I wanna be this, you know, physically fit guy, right? There is always something in nature that or in, in, a, in fiction that will change you. And I, my high school football coach said every practice, he goes, you either get better or you get worse. You mm-hmm. never stay the same. Yeah. And I think that's the, how media affects us. You know, if you only watch, you know, Amazon rings of power, you're not going to walk away with, I mean, you're certainly not going to hear about March 25th, yeah. you know, and, and the incarnation of Christ. So, so we do have to, uh, seek after, even if it's not intentionally Christian, right? Something that comes from a, a moral fairy world, right? Mm-hmm. A moral world. Yeah. So, so for those that are kind of watching right now, and I don't know, some people might be going, what the heck are these guys talking about? <laughs> you know, and I think the thing that we're, and I want to keep hashing this out, but to kind of bring it back to the meta narrative is stories are powerful, mm-hmm. uh, very powerful. Our lives are stories, right? We live in stories. Every day we're living out a story. It's our story that is included with the people around us. It's included with God's story and his intention of, you know, drawing us into himself. All of these things. We live in stories. We don't live in a, like a commentary, mm-hmm. right? In other words, we don't live in kind of a, you know, to, right now, I'm going to go do something brave, and brave is good because da, right. da, 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 we live in this like I want to be like Aragon, mm-hmm. or I want to you know certainly I want to be like King David and not King Saul. All of these stories have a great impact on mm-hmm. us. So, so what we're advocating for, what you've advocated for, right in your master's degree in the study, is to say Christians throughout time have used these great stories of tradition, or have you know created stories mm-hmm. in order to impart these deep biblical truths of how we should be formed as Christians and to make that a very formative and potent, you know, uh, tool. Yeah. And, and everything is, you know, very much. And so this, we talk about the Christian worldview and sometimes we try to atomize Christianity, right? So you can believe in this doctrine, but not this doctrine. And Lutherans call this the, um, the felicitous inconsistency, right? That somebody can deny that baptism does anything, and still be saved by faith, Mm -hmm. right? So um, there's always this, there's an interconnectedness of all these doctrines. And you'd said something about not only um, sort of taking the myths, but then making new myths. And so that's what Tolkien calls mythopoeia, right? Myth making or world making. And Edmund Spencer, uh, to to go back to that briefly. So in his Fairy Queen, everybody should read it. It's like the, I I think we can call it the first modern English epic. So it's definitely... Mm -hmm old, right? You have to work on some of the words, but it's English, right? You don't, you're not reading it in translation, but at the end of all of this, he has these, he calls them two cantos on mutability. And so after he tells the whole story of, of all these characters and, uh, learning about justice and virtue and everything, then it sort of zooms out and you have this cosmic conversation between change and nature and time and who's actually ruling over everything Mm -hmm. and change claims that that she's ruling over everything right because everything is change but then time and nature are actually like no 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 even though everything appears to be changing uh there is this great meta narrative right Mm -hmm. this godhead over all things 
So change uses the example of uh, she, she processes out all of the months. So January, but then time and nature say, no, no, no. Like the calendar repeats. Mm. So the change is actually, um, you, there, there is a consistency in the change. And, and this stuff matters. So Heraclitus, who's, I mean, even before Socrates, he gives us the famous phrase, you, you can't step in the same river twice. And his idea being that because everything is changing, right, there's no, you can't really know anything. This gets picked up later by, by guys like Hegel. And then later, I mean, Karl Marx will pick this up. Mm -hmm. So you have this idea of, of change and, and progress. And so once you get rid of this, not only a Christian worldview, but a Christian idea of how, of how the world was made and mm -hmm. how the universe functions, then everything else can slip in. So even something as simple as saying, everything is ruled by change, which at first blush, we'd all say, yeah, right? Things change all the time. But once you sort of reject that idea that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, mm -hmm. you, you've bought into this meta narrative that, that change is what rules over everything. Because the biblical teaching would be, you know, a thousand years is like a day to, right. to and I change not. So mm -hmm. therefore there's, there's this, would immutability be the right yeah, word? Yeah. Right. There's immutability. This immutability. God, yeah. Yeah. Right. That this, this God that does not change is above that which changes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what does the Christian do? Well, the Christian, you know, we live in the year 2023. Things have very much changed since 1500, mm -hmm. 700, you know, 30 ish AD. Yeah. And however, truth has not changed. Right. Mm -hmm. So these, these truths, these, ob these objective things, you know, maybe you can say truth, goodness and beauty, yeah, right. those things have not changed and those things rule over change. Mm -hmm. And the goal of the Christian is to not flow with change like a leaf in the wind, but to be drawn into these things that are immutable, unchangeable, that, that don't, you know, they're not ruled by these, mm -hmm. these lesser things. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, that's the words of the new Testament, right? Don't, don't be carried off by every wind of doctrine, mm -hmm. you know, and whether that's Jewish myths or, you know, um, so one thing that comes to mind is, uh, Neil Gaiman, you mm -hmm. ever read him? So he did, uh, American gods, good omens. Um, he's, he's a, avowed unbeliever but he tells this great story of when he was a kid and he read the lord of the rings he was so mad that he didn't write it that he invented a world where he went into a parallel universe and went back in time and he was the one who wrote the lord of the rings really right and so where's i going with that oh, right so no but it was beautiful yeah okay cool yeah yeah so yeah so so we're advocating for this now let's let's go back a little bit to like paul Right. So you, you were mentioning how Paul was, was well-educated, mm -hmm. certainly in Judaism. I mean, probably right. had much of it memorized, you know, fully, right. Mm -hmm. Very well-versed there, but he also understood these, these pagan myths. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to the point of the, the, the statement that Lewis makes, C.S. Lewis, right. The myth made fact. Yeah. And I know we, we've talked about this before and we both very much like this, that, that Christ is also able to go to these Greek mythologies. And he's able to say, what you're looking for in these stories is actually, it, it's, it's reaching its fruition today. Mm -hmm. And the one example I like is when, is it John that brings the Greeks to Jesus? He's got some Greek friends. Oh, Philip, yeah. Oh, Philip, yeah. yeah. And he brings them to Jesus, right? And then I think it, there's like a break there mm -hmm. in the way that the, at least the ESV and probably yeah. NIV is like broken up. But this, it doesn't make any sense that it would stop there. Philip brings these Greeks to Jesus. What happens? Well, then immediately Jesus is speaking. Mm -hmm. I would strongly assert that he's probably speaking to the Greeks. Right. And what does he say? He says, well, a seed must, or a, what, is, what is it? A plant must die so that the seed may go into the ground so that it may grow again. Mm -hmm. And he's speaking, of course, about the incarnation, but he's also speaking about a very popular mythology in Greek tradition at that time. So he's speaking in their language to say, you have this myth, right? This, this grand story that you don't think is historically true, but it mm -hmm. teaches something about truth, about a dying and rising flow, right? You see it in nature, right? Things die in the fall, and then they kind of resurrect in the spring. He's saying, ah, you see that theme, and it's even in your mythologies. Now you're going to understand what that really means and what that points towards when I myself die and go into the ground so that I may rise again so that all men may rise again, right? So there's an example of Jesus using that tactic mm -hmm. and that you had a couple examples that you referenced earlier where paul uses the same tactic right right yeah he does that when he's walking through athens right he goes oh i perceive that you're very religious mm -hmm. and then he quotes um 
Epimenides who says all Cretans are liars. He, he quotes this to Titus also. And the, the all Cretans are liars. So he, he quotes all Cretans are liars, sorry, to Titus at the Areopagus. He quotes a, a different line from the, from the same poem. But the part of the, the thrust of that opening section of the poem is that the Cretans are liars because they say they have a tomb of Zeus. But we all know that there's no tomb of Zeus because Zeus isn't dead because gods don't die and go into tombs. Mm -hmm. So Paul isn't just saying, you know, all Cretans are liars or something like that. He's Mm -hmm. actually invoking this idea that here's some pagans who said God can die knowing that they're telling a lie. Um, We know from the Bible, from the Gospel of Matthew, that there were Jews who said "We, we have to, you know, keep this conspiracy from happening and let everybody think that. Christ is still dead and in the tomb. Mm-hmm. So Paul is, is tying these things together. So just as truth is universal, false religion is also universal, mm-hmm. that, that you have this carried out throughout the, the different traditions. Um, another example is Plato will speak about sort of the, the realm of, of reality, right? Where you have the ideal things sort of up in heaven, and then down here on earth is just the shadow realm. The author of the book of Hebrews talks about the temple in those exact same terms, right? You have this heavenly temple and then the image of such on earth is mm-hmm. the temple made by hands. So you have this, if we want to call it appropriation or use of platonic thought that really I don't think is very clear in the Old Testament, right? So so I think Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, right? He's drawing from Ooh, this. I like that, yeah. Yeah, he's drawing from this Greek tradition. Yeah, yeah. So how did the, how did the early Christians do, do they carry this on? You know the early fathers. I mean, if you're talking about Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, all the way up to like Augustine, Jerome, all these people are, are they are they kind of using this this kind of tool to some degree? Absolutely. I mean, that's just what it means to be educated. So Paul didn't stumble across these texts, right? Mm-hmm. Part of what it meant to be an educated Pharisee was to know the Greek classics, to mm-hmm. know these poems. Um, Luke, I think, is is very much. Uh, you know, Luke and Paul are, are obviously very close. You see that in the book of Acts, but he's very much in tune with his classical tradition. Um, Julian the Apostate, who I forget his dates, but he's one of the early Christian turned non-Christian emperors. One of the reasons he apostatizes is because he's taught all these classic texts and he's like, paganism is way better than Christianity, but he's taught them by Christian bishops. Mm-hmm. All right. So very early on in the Roman Empire, Christians are teaching um you know maybe not what we think of the classics just because a lot of the texts had had been lost especially in uh in the latin speaking world Mm -hmm. right but certainly homer is a part of this um a lot of aristotle maybe some of plato right so definitely the poems the plays everybody's in in conversation with these with these pieces in the same sense i would say that the average christian preacher can reference Um, not only a modern day event, but even, you know, Spider-Man or Batman, right? That even if you've never seen a Spider-Man movie, I I think I can say the average American knows that Spider-Man is a a teenager who has spider-like powers, right? If nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. They know that, right? So there's this idea that you're sort of entrenched in the myth Mm -hmm. and and it is the job of of the preacher not only to draw out scripture, but also draw out the, the myth in which we're entrenched, right? The meta narrative that we're playing in. Mm-hmm. So how did how would they interact with were there Jewish myths? Oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 How, how would Christian early Christians how would they interact with those? Or do do you know that? Yeah, I mean, Paul at one point he just says, "Don't chase after Jewish myths." Mm-hmm. Um, but then the Book of Jude, I mean, he's he's referencing the Book of Enoch. He's re- referencing the Apocalypse of Moses. Mm-hmm. You know, he's. Uh, and he's doing it while he's talking about uh, Balaam and and Korah's rebellion, right? And all this different stuff. So there's obviously, I don't, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself. Mm-hmm. Scripture never disagrees with Scripture, right? But when Paul says, don't chase after Jewish, or don't devote yourself to Jewish myths, and Jude is saying, here's a useful Jewish myth, I don't think those are contradictory things Mm -hmm. um, because Jude isn't sort of building any doctrine on those stories or those Mm -hmm. folk tales. So he's doing something similar to what a modern-day preacher might do when they reference Spider-Man or Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Like he's doing that to say this is a very useful illustration that everybody understands. Mm -hmm. And is that a value then for like modern-day Christians to 
go back and also read some of these great myths, great stories to say that these things have been utilized by Christians throughout the years. So it's kind of this common conversation. Like as a Christian, Mm -hmm. you're entering into the ongoing conversation. Yes. And it's not just Christians that are alive today. Everyone should be invited to that table, right? It's not (laughs) just me and pick my three favorite modern day Christians, but like Tolkien deserves to be there. Lewis deserves to be there. Chesterton deserves to be there. Yeah. Uh, George MacDonald deserves to be there. Augustine deserves to be there. Aquinas deserves to be in there. Like Irenaeus, right? So it's it's having this collection of what does Christianity stand for and mm-hmm. believe. And if you're not rooted in that tradition or the language and the dialogue of our tradition, then you're going to get cut off from a lot of these deeply rooted Christian understandings that might not be as easily accessible in 2023 mm-hmm. right and that's what i think what does lewis say he says for every one modern one modern for every modern book that you read you should read two ancient books I like that. yeah i mean i and i would say actually they're they're more accessible than any other time in history mm-hmm. i mean the 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 digit digitization of humanities mm-hmm. um i mean so safaria i'd mentioned that you know perseus at tufts university i mean there, there are so many online things you can go to a used bookstore and find a cheap copy of you know plato's dialogues for five bucks so they're more accessible than ever um i mean you've had andy richard on here right yeah i mean Mm -hmm. that's uh, pastor richards is it pastor richard is incredible but that's one of his things too you know when he's teaching children uh, at his school he's he's in he's exposing them to this whole swath so that you can have the conversation because if I get up in a pulpit and I say something about whatever Bilbo destroying the ring and nobody's ever read Lord of the Rings, it's going to fall flat. Mm -hmm. And if you try to understand what Paul is saying when he speaks about the, the heavenly temple, the image of the temple and then the realized temple on earth, and you've never read Plato's, uh, you know, allegory of the cave, Mm -hmm. it's going to be nonsense to you. Yeah. And so I think there's actually, or, or, you know, Paul citing uh, or quoting Eratos or Epimenides or Callimachus or whoever, whatever he's doing there, there's a, um, I don't want to say moral, right. But a literary responsibility on the part of the Christian to, to chase down the footnote, Mm -hmm. right. To say, what is Paul getting at here? Or, what is Jude talking about when he ta- speaks about Michael and, and the devil fighting over the body of Moses or mm-hmm. contending over the body of Moses, right? There's a, there's a responsibility to chase that down. And I think that that's, um, that starts at a very young age just by encouraging curiosity. Mm-hmm. So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with if you don't understand what's, if you don't understand some of these trends in Judaism, right. then you're not going to understand what's going on in Judaism at the time where Christ comes along. And if you don't understand that context, then you're going to naturally take the context of what Jesus is saying and you're going to, you might not, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll go to heresy, Mm -hmm. but it does mean you're not going to understand it in its proper context. Right. Which, as you said earlier, we as Christians, we say, you know, the scriptures are, that's the inspired word of God. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that is infallible. Um, However, if if the only book you ever pick up in the Bi- is the Bible, first off, that would be the best book. To, right, if right, you're only yeah, going to pick yeah. up one, but we don't advocate that you stop there. Mm-hmm. Because especially for us today, we don't understand these themes or these motifs that are present for a first century Christian. You know, we're, we're 2,000 years removed from that. Mm-hmm. So we're going to miss some of these things that would have been common speech for someone like Paul or his audience or these very early Christians, which I think... In, Correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but I think that has led to a lot of the modern day, let's say, American Christianity that looks at things like the sacraments, Mm -hmm. right? And says, that's not all that. I don't understand that because it is. That's that's not a very modern day understanding. We don't have religions around us doing blood sacrifices. We haven't just had this, this, you know, we're not coming out of a temple period where you're having all of these sacrifices that atone for sin and blood must be spilled and all of this stuff. That's... You know, for John the Baptist, he grew up as a priest's son. Mm -hmm. So on a daily basis, he was watching animals be sacrificed. So like when he comes in and he says, behold, the lamb of God, right? Here's John, who is now the summation of all the prophets in the Old Testament. And he's trying to give you a proper lens for who Christ is going to be. John, the evangelist who's writing this is saying, I'm going to talk to you about who Jesus is. You want to understand who he is? Let me set the context. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There was a pastor that did a uh, kind of a, a, a pretty intense in- in- survey online, and he said, "What what does John mean by that?" And almost unanimously, everyone's like, "Well, G- Jesus is you know nice and pleasant and cuddly like oh, a wow. lamb, <laughs> right?" Wow. 
And that is completely missing the point. That's not yeah. at all what John's talking about. Well, well, how do we think of lambs nowadays? Well, we're not slaughtering lambs. Mm -hmm. no, of course not. So we're thinking them as nice, cuddly animals. They're kind of nice, da, 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 da. John the Baptist, a priest's son, grew up in the sacrificial system. And therefore, he's saying, here comes the one who is going to be the blood sacrifice that's going to atone for the sins of the world once and for all. And that is the, that's the lens by which you're going to understand what's going on here. That's not natural for us. So therefore, mm -hmm. if we don't go back and learn some of the history, some of the context, some of the stories and entrench ourselves in that, we're going to miss some of these very potent themes that are going to run through the gospels and shape who Christ really is. Right. And so I, I love that you bring up the example of sheep. So I grew up raising sheep and I, you know, never any love lost. They're some of the stupidest animals ever. <laughs> and when I was on Vicarage in Philadelphia, I loved, I was so excited for Good Shepherd Sunday because I had the sermon, I had the imagery. So our sheep, uh, we, we'd fatten them up, you know, to sell at market. And so it was this special food that was like high in protein, had all the vitamins and everything. And they would stick their head through the fence to try to eat the grass on the other side and then get their head stuck. And we'd have to go pull them out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is perfect. This is like the best imagery for what we Christians do, you know. God sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies and we go chasing after other gods, blah, blah, blah. So I give this sermon in Philadelphia and it totally falls flat. And afterwards, everyone's like, oh, Vicar, we just think about, you know, you as a little boy playing with these little sheep and it's so cute, blah, 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 and all this. Fast forward, you know, six or seven years or whatever it's been, I give a similar sermon, I won't say the same sermon, in Lovell, Wyoming, very agricultural, and everybody gets it, right? Mm -hmm. Sheep are dumb when... You know, I am Jesus, little lamb, you know, rural Amer Wyomingites don't like singing that song because <laughs> they don't want to be a little lamb. Right. Yeah. It's it's hard to say I'm this dumb, hard headed creature. So even that, you know, going from, you know, eastern east coast U.S. to, to Rocky Mountain U.S. I mean, that's a big shift in sort of what not that's not even a myth. Right. But just sort of a cultural milieu that you're playing in. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you speak? Um, you know, I, again, now that I'm back in Wyoming, I never speak about road rage because there's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's no traffic here. No, there's not. In fact, we were talking about that today. We were driving around. I'm going, well, everyone's driving 200 the speed limit. What's going on here? You know, I'm back. I was out in New England. And that's yeah, not right. the case out there. Exactly. You know, did you guys hit a Wyoming roadblock? Was anybody moving steer or cows? We had something yesterday where we were stopped for like 20 minutes and I don't know what was going on. Yeah. So it might've been that. That happens sometimes where mm -hmm. it's most, I mean, it's not on the interstates, but like two lane roads, people are just moving and yeah. you, you get there when you get there. Cause what are you going to do? So if 2000 miles, I don't know if that's what it is, but 1500 miles, whatever you yeah. want to call it. If that's enough to make co like cultural references and illustrations, either potent or obsolete. Exactly. It's in the same year and same time. Mm -hmm. How much of a difference if you're going to go, you know, to an entirely different country 2000 years removed right. from now. And what are we inheriting? We're inheriting these beautiful illustrations or these references that the biblical authors are using, um, referring to. And if they're using those, we can't just say, oh yeah, we're, you know, easy to pick up that mm -hmm. illustration. We've got to go back and entrench ourselves in wh what are these dialogues? What's the yeah. context? You know, what are these Greeks that are coming to speak to Jesus? Why does Jesus choose this illustration about a seed falling into the ground and then growing again? Mm -hmm. Certainly we understand just from the biblical narrative that it's pointing to his death and resurrection. Right. Why is he choosing to use that for the Greeks? And then you can look and you can, you can start to gesture towards mm -hmm. these interactions that Jesus is having with people from different backgrounds and different stories. And he's speaking in that language. And I think you know, the more that I start to understand these things, it really does bring that biblical text alive. Yeah. And and, and it's, it's, it's a hunger and a thirst for understanding those things, you know, a curiosity. Um, you know, so if, if you read something difficult, one, one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given is that when you read a, uh, it's article or book, whatever it is, and you come across a word you don't know, stop, look it up, figure it out, and then go back and start reading again. And, and this lack of curiosity, um, I, I mean, certainly I think among Christians, maybe it's among Americans, I'm not sure, um, where it's just sort of. I, I don't know why Greeks are coming to Jesus, but like it's here in the Bible. So that's what's happening, mm -hmm. you know, and it sort of stops there instead of let's look into what's going on here. Or, you know, when Matthew says, as was spoken by the prophet, like, okay, which prophet, mm -hmm. right? And where did he say it? And why did he say it? And what's the context and yeah. all of this stuff here, you know, there, there has to be that curiosity. Um, 
Lewis Marcos, who teaches. Oh, yeah. yeah. He writes the book, The Myth Made Fact. Yeah. So uh, he's building off of Lewis's he's awesome. Achilles have, to Christ. Have you listened to his? He does a great courses lecture uh, on literary theory. No, it's old. No. It's it's probably like 20 years old, but it's so great. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> I mean, just anything uh, Dr. Marcos does, I, I think, is worth reading. Mm -hmm. um, but he I just lost my train of thought. Well, he, yeah, he's doing a good job of kind of resurrecting that kind of oh sorry yeah so yeah. so he talks about not being um childish but childlike mm -hmm. in our approach to to philosophy to literature to everything that there needs to be this curiosity of you know so to speak uh chasing the butterfly when you're out on a walk mm -hmm. and just trying to figure out what's going on there yeah yeah and that 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 uh that instinct to want to learn and to soak things up right in the cure and as you said kind of that curiosity um oh, i just had a thought and i just lost it but um it's late <laughs> It's, it is late. Um, oh, was, oh, yeah, there was an article I just read recently, um, and it was about how children's fairy tales will save the West. Yes. And the point is in these children's fairy tales that have, I mean, over and over again throughout the th generation to generation, these are these great stories that children are reading, and it's meant to open up and introduce these great themes that will find their fruition in the biblical stories mm -hmm. and in their teachings. But you're you're preparing kids in their as they're seeing these grandiose stories, and once again, vice and virtue playing out. Vice leads to bad things, bad consequences. Virtue is going to lead to good things, you know, coming about. Um, and just how potent of a tool that is for opening up the imagination, not meaning like imaginary things, but mm -hmm. this curiosity towards things. And then you get to the biblical narratives, yeah. and you see these themes play out, and it's just it, it feeds a hungry heart. Yeah. You know, that's what Chesterton calls it, the, the sacramental imagination, right? Mm -hmm. Of this idea of just sort of a, you know, a, a mystifying of the world. I mean, that's, the, you know, people will call the enlightenment, the demystification of the world mm -hmm. of, of the West, where, you know, everything becomes just sort of what it is. Um, I'm, I'm going to forget who it is. Uh, Dawkins, maybe one of the famous atheists, you know, there's this Face. who knows if it's a true story right but a story of he's out for a walk with his daughter and she sees a butterfly and she says something about you know isn't that so beautiful and he's like no <laughs> like it evolved to get here to deter predators or to blend in or something like this as opposed to just saying that's beautiful right um you know if if my son says wow what a beautiful sunset i don't correct him and i'm like mm -hmm. no it's because there's fires in montana right now yeah <laughs> like no it, yes it's a beautiful sunset yeah and just let it be that yeah and you know and the curiosity i think it it, it does go along with um uh, oh so, sorry th there's an article called sanctified imagination right there so oh right in front of you yeah, yeah. read it, christian culture been, it's yeah, a good that, magazine good plug that might yeah. have been, that might have been the article that i read <laughs> okay yeah yeah um Right. You know, that this, you know, always be curious, always want to be wanting to learn more. And there's a great push, you know, in our circles for classical education, which is a good thing. But I don't think we should neglect uh, those who are long removed from formal education. Mm -hmm. You know, you can cultivate virtue in an octogenarian. You can cultivate curiosity in a, in a middle aged man, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a responsibility of not only preachers, but just Christians in general, right, mm -hmm. to have these conversations to be able to sit down and watch, you know, an hour long YouTube video instead of a, a 10 second clip or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what, one of the books that drove this home for me, or I, I shouldn't say it that way. I should say it actually, it kind of sparked my understanding for the necessity to read some of these books, um, was it was CS Lewis's surprised by joy, which is his autobiography. And that was the toughest book for me to read because as he goes through, he can't, so he's telling his story of kind of it's his autobiography, right? But his, his overarching narrative is how he moved from atheism to Christianity mm -hmm. and how that, that awoke in him, right? And it's, it's a really beautiful story. But he can't tell his story without almost every two or three paragraphs. He's referencing with like one line these books that he read, either children's fairy yeah. tales or George MacDonald or, you know, Augustine's uh, City of God, all of these, these stories that he read in his education. And everyone at his time that was educated was reading those exact same books, right? And he's writing this in like the, maybe the forties or fifties. Mm -hmm. And he assumes that the reader of surprised by joy understands every one of those little references. So he doesn't like reference it and then spend two pages telling the story. He just references it 
and he assumes that everyone knows his reference. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, I don't know any of these references. And that's a problem yeah. because what that means is that even when I go back to Lewis, who isn't that, that long ago, mm -hmm. I'm missing a lot of the context of what is forming his thoughts, his ideas, his th theology and philosophy. I don't have any of that raw material that he had. So therefore I'm not even getting all of C.S. Lewis, who is by far my favorite author. And that really awoke in me like, man, I got to go back. I got to go, you know, let, let's dive into some Chesterton. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into George MacDonald. I'm like, man, I got to read City of God because if not, I'm going to get a very superficial understanding of his teaching or let alone go back further. And you're, you're, you're never going to be able to mine the gold and the beauty right. that all of these Christian authors are giving to us to help polish us in our Christian faith. And if we're mm -hmm. cut off from that, we're going to have certainly a saving Christian faith. That's not what I'm trying to yeah, you know, argue yeah. against, but I'm going to miss so much of the beauty that mm -hmm. is at my fingertips that I can access. I need to go back and access these things. Yeah, so um, you, you saying that reminded me our, our seminary class gift was a, we commissioned a translation of Valerius Herberger's uh, Great Works of God on the book of Exodus. Mm. And there's a few of, I don't know if you were a part of it, um, Matt Carver, who did the translation, he's brilliant. Um, he, he asked some of, the, some of our classmates to do some of the editing. And like the, the editing part was easy, but the hardest part was chasing down these footnotes. So Herberger is like second generation Lutheranism. And he does the same thing where he's like, you know, just think about sometimes it's historical, right? You know, with that plague that happened last year. Okay, well, I got to find out, you know, what year he's writing, what plague he's talking about. But then, yeah, he's quoting all of these myths, German folk tales, all of this stuff. And, and I never know if he really expects everybody to, to know everything or if Lewis expects his readers to, or if he's just pointing them to it. Cause I'll do that sometimes where, you know, I'll say something, you know, if I'm talking about the book of Jude, right? Like, and we all remember the story of the sons of Korah, right? Mm -hmm. The average Sunday going Christian doesn't remember that story. Mm -hmm. I am being very intentional in saying, you know, go look it up. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if Lewis is sometimes telling us, go look it up and, and that we should see, you know, these, these thick footnotes, not as pretentious, but as an encouragement to go back and find, you know, again, when Matthew says, as the prophet says, or as the prophet Isaiah says, he's not saying, take my word for it. Mm -hmm. right? He's saying, go back, look it up, figure yeah. this out. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give you one example of, of one. So this is a reference Lewis makes that uh, I went back and read. So Lilith. Yeah. <laughs> Have you read that? Or I know the story you know of the Lilith. Story. Yeah. yeah. So George MacDonald writes this uh, myth, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. On Lil it's called Lilith. It has a historical context of yeah. the character of Lilith. But there's this point where uh, Lilith needs to cut off her arm or her hand because her hand is basically this. She grasps, she tried to grasp onto the power of God, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, cut off your hand and enter the kingdom of heaven. And she keeps, she thinks she does it. And then she wakes up and she realized that she didn't actually do it. Oh, wow. And this happens like three or four times before she finally does it and, you know, and enters into heaven and whatnot. But the point of that story, and Lewis draws on this in a couple of his works, is that so often we say like, okay, Christ wants me to do this. And then we think because we've thought about it, like I need, I need, to, I need right. to cut this bad habit or I need to read my Bible more. Mm -hmm. Merely because we've entertained the idea of doing it, we think that we've accomplished it. Uh, but Lewis re remorses that so often in his life, he's like, I think that I've accomplished this, you know, this kind of, this, this Christian undertaking. And then he reflects and he goes, oh, wait, I haven't. I've just been thinking about it. Right. And then he tries to go back and do it. And he's, oh, I haven't done it. So it's such a great, just teaching and a great illustration of how we might strive towards Christian virtue, mm -hmm. Christian morality. And when we go to reflect, we're like, man, we haven't even taken any steps. I've just been standing in my place, thinking about it rather than doing it. Right. Right. So, so in McDonald's, so Lilith is redeemed in the end. I'm almost positive. That's awesome. Yeah. Can okay. you check that Bennett? Cause that's, yeah, I'm almost positive she is. Yeah. But I mean, there's another, there's a great theme in there too, where mm -hmm. like Adam, um, is this uh, grave digger. So he, he's taking care of this grave, right? Okay. And he enters into kind of this inverse world, right? And what's, and Adam says, well, you must you must go to sleep before you can awake, right? Awake, go sleep or rise. Okay. Right. And so what's Adam doing? He's helping, he's helping his, his uh, descendants kind of die to this world so that mm -hmm. they may rise to the next. And that's basically his that's vocation awesome. is being the kind of almost the shepherd mm -hmm. for his children who have fallen because of 
his sin, right? And because of Eve's or Lilith's sin, kind of this, this right. mythic state. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Did you find it, Bennett? It's at a wordpress.com, oh, so yeah. it's got to be good. They don't pay for an actual URL. Yeah, there's, so there's, there's a it. lot of words up on that screen, so I don't know. That's, too much. That's fine. Let me ask you this. So um, so people, if people are still following us down our rabbit right. hole of yeah. you know, our, our shared interest, I, we'll see. <laughs> right. But if they are and they go, okay, great. So you're telling me that I should read The City of God. You're telling me I should read Lilith. You're telling me I should read, maybe I haven't even read Lewis or, you know. Mm -hmm. Where would you recommend if so someone who is kind of they're saying, okay, I'm buying what you're what you're putting down. I can't read 30 books this year. Mm -hmm. Certainly 30 books that are, you know, you know, from fifteen hundred years ago. Right. If you could pick three books for people to dedicate for for this next year, what would you recommend? And I, I don't mean just like theological books, but books yeah. that fall into this kind of, wow. of line of what we're talking about. Three books? Yeah. Because that might be that should be attainable. So th this is cheating, mm -hmm. but um, Harold Bloom has a collection of poetry, and I think it's just called Poetry and Anthology. Um, it, and so it's like all, basically it's just like a little bit of, of all of Western poetry with introductory essays. And so I think readers are, you know, sort of segmented things like that are good. So, I, I, okay, that's cheating. That one, that one doesn't count. But I will say if you can find, you know, sort of a, a collection of Western anthology or a collection of Christian fiction or something like that. I mm -hmm. think that's a great way to sort of jump in mm -hmm. and sort of figure out what you want to read. Okay. So three books, I would say, uh, the confessions by Augustine, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. I heard, so uh, Dr. Marcos actually calls it his testimony. Mm. And I'm like, man, it sounds so mushy, but like, that's actually a really good way of speaking about all right, so we'll say The Confessions by Augustine. Which is 5th century, right? Um, yeah, I think a little bit earlier maybe. Yeah. yeah. So just to kind of advocate for that, right? You want, if you want to know what a, what a prominent Christian thinker is, is really wrestling with as far as like the application of mm -hmm. Christianity to his life tangibly, like there's a great data point, right? You want to know what Christians are wrestling with and dealing with 1,500 years ago? Like that's right. just a great way to, to calibrate yourself and say, how does that compare contrast to where I'm at mm -hmm. right now? Well, and it's, I mean, like just sort of the bare bones of the story, right? You know, my mom and dad can't agree on what church to go to. So I'm going to some cool church that all the kids are going to, and they're letting me sleep with my girlfriend. But then eventually I'm going to come to grips with true Christianity and figure out, was that my wife? Am I, am I an adulterer? Right. I have a son by her. What's going on? I mean, it's, it could take place in, in the 21st century, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's, it's just beautiful. So, okay. Then I would say, um, sorry, another, another plug for, for a reader. Mm -hmm. So Hillsdale, uh, college does a lot of free courses mm -hmm. and one of them is just, I think it's on the great books and there are little snippets of, of different texts. The confessions are part of that. So I'd read the confessions by Augustine. I think if I can call it one book, the, uh, the space trilogy by CS Lewis. Oh yeah. So, and, and it is published as one, one in one volume. So mm -hmm. that does count as one book. It's technically three. That I think is super important. Um, again, 21st century applic. It's not that old, obviously, but 21st century applications. And then just because I'm on that same string, I would say the communist manifesto, <laughs> which is like definitely out of left field with mm -hmm. what we're talking about, but um, and this has been on my mind, different things that I'm thinking about, but I think it's also important to read, to read sort of things that we know we're going to disagree with. So if, if, if your pastor tells you, whatever, go read the Augsburg confession, right? He's saying, read it, knowing that I, your pastor vowed to uphold this. I'm telling you it's good. I'm not saying don't think about it. Right. But you can read this knowing that there's going to be good stuff. And I think it is important, especially for mature Christians to be exposed to not necessarily bad theology, right? But to be exposed to things where we can say, hey, this is problematic. And if, we're, if we can take a fairy story and say, look at these, these connections that I can make here, maybe we can take a, a bad political writing and make these connections too, so. Well, it's kind of like, so, like if you were to read Lord of the Rings, for instance, mm -hmm. Tolkien's doing two things. He's showing, he's showing Aragon, Frodo, Bilbo, Gandalf, Legolas, all these characters of virtue to strive after. But equally, what is he doing? He's, he's showing 
and trying to articulate what evil does and what evil strives after, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the lust for power, um, Boromir's struggle with the ring, right. um, the way that evil cannot actually create anything. It can only warp that which is good, right? So he's moving in both directions. He's saying, you need to understand what, what, what to strive for and you need to understand what to be wary of. So to your point, you're saying, understand like mm -hmm. the confessions by Augustine yeah. or the Augsburg confession, right. you know, what we would say, strive after these kind of truths but also understand what kind of things to be wary of because these kind of teachings are going, you're going to interact with them and you need to understand how to, to smell them out and to say, no, 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 I understand the roots of that and that's not good. Yeah, and, and that's part of the, the Western canon too. I mean, you, you don't read the, the Iliad cover to cover and say, oh, here's the good guy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like there's so many moral failings, mm -hmm. but that does stir you up to say, okay, I'm not going to... Um, let rage take over and control all my actions. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to be like Achilles. I'm not going to be like these different characters. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about, what do you think about where American Christianity is today? Yeah. So, I, so I've been reading a lot of stuff um, on Marxism. And so that's definitely where, where my mind is. That's part of um, a few pastors from the Wyoming district. We've been working to, to put forward overtures um, so we just had our synodical convention a few months ago, and this is how business is done, right? You put forward overtures, they become resolutions, you vote on them, something happens or nothing happens, right? Yeah, yeah. But to be able to articulate sort of what we reject about, about Marxism and sort of seeing where there are these roots in um, mainstream education, so government schools, the, the way that we just sort of think politically. So again, going back to that idea that change is what rules over everything. You know, we, we've really adopted these non-Christian philosophies and, and in some ways anti-Christian philosophies and, and tried to put them alongside of, of Christianity. So, I mean, evolution is a great example of, okay, I can believe the Bible is the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God, totally true, and... Darwin, Darwinian evolution, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, they are in incompatible systems, mm -hmm. but we've created this, you know, anti fairy world, right? Where truth doesn't matter. And so we can hold these things side by side. And so I think, um, the, the future of American Christianity rests, um, in this recapturing of the West, recapturing the great texts of old and the way we talked about things. And, and when you see guys like Lewis or Tolkien or Spencer, engaging in world building, it sort of makes you take a step back and say, okay, well, I think there's a God. And if there is a God, he made the world. So how did he make the world? And it doesn't really fit with anything in the Christian religion that he would create the world painted by Darwinian evolution mm -hmm. or the world painted by Marxism or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. There's certainly a lot of mutually exclusive ideas that people allow to resonate and to be part of their ethos and understanding and mm -hmm. worldview and that's that, that certainly seems to be an issue and back to what we said before i think part of that is we've lost our we've lost our heritage but we've even lost the context of understanding what all of these different biblical themes and teachings what what, what are those things driving towards yeah. and if we don't understand what they're driving towards then we can allow these wrong conclusions to, to kind of seep in and say oh yeah they're you know they're, they're, they work well together. Mm -hmm. You know, the creation story in the Bible is very adamant on God has created yeah. things that are good, yeah. right? And that God has created man from the get-go mm -hmm. and that man is in God's image and he's not an accident and all of these kind of things. And therefore, you're not an accident. You were knitted in your mother's womb and this is supposed to create an identity for you as one who was made on purpose in God's image. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not compatible with an evolutionary idea. Right. And if you try to move those together, you're going to create a very bastardized Christianity and mm -hmm. ethos and philosophy. And, you know, you used the example earlier of the, uh, the coral reef that dies and still remains. And I think there are shades, maybe, maybe that's more European Christianity than American Christianity, where you sort of have the shell, but nothing, uh, no meat on the bones. Um, whereas with American Christianity, there is this, you know, one, one sort of bright spot, I think, is this rediscovery of maybe not the classics in the way that we've been talking about them, but um, Francis Chan, mm -hmm. are you familiar with him? Yeah. So there's this video that came out a, a couple months ago, maybe a year ago, where he's going off about the Lord's Supper. And he's like, if you guys actually go back and like read what's going on in the New Testament, it's super important. Like mm -hmm. 
we should treat this not just as like some, you know, cute thing we do. Like this is a big deal. Mm. And, you know, as Lutherans, we're like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> duh. Right. But, but there is a beauty there that somebody, um, cause the, the unfalsifiable claim is that if you're only reading the Bible and you're taking it seriously, you're going to end up Lutheran. Right. Um, and we're actually seeing shades of that. And I'm not saying everybody's going to join the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod or anything, mm -hmm. but you have an, uh, He's non-denominational, right? Francis I believe Chan. so. Yeah. I'm not positive. Yeah. So you have this independent or semi-independent, certainly not part of a sacramental tradition, mm -hmm. independently coming to this conclusion just by reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was, again, on vicarage in Philadelphia, there is a, a non-denominational church and the pastor's brother or cousin was an Orthodox priest. And so this guy at a non-denominational church started using the church year. And everybody was so thankful because mm -hmm. <laughs> they're like, oh, we have, you know, Lent now. Easter doesn't come out of nowhere. We have this preparation for Lent and we have this rhythm. And just, you know, it was still the non-denominational package, mm -hmm. but just his preaching topics were based on this church year. And so there's this rediscovery of a Christian tradition happening in fits and starts throughout the U.S. And I think as that gets pushed forward, right, if you say hey, I want to read more about the Lord's Supper, you're going to have to read a Lutheran or a Catholic or, or an Orthodox, Anglican, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to do that and you're going to eventually stumble across a footnote where you say, who's Augustine? What's the city of God? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to go back and read that and you're going to say, why is he talking about two cities? Who's this Plato guy? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you're, you're going to end up participating in that Western canon just by investigating your own faith. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that is spot on. Cause I would say that's been my experience. Like mm -hmm. I said, it started with Lewis and then I'm like, man, who's Lewis referencing here? And then I go to George yeah. McDonald, you know? And then what's interesting is I did a study on Thomas Aquinas, uh, just recently read, read a decent amount of his stuff. And I found all of these different themes that he was teaching on that were these themes that I thought Lewis was just kind of like spitballing on. I'm going, right. Oh man. Oh yeah, of course. Lewis did read Aquinas, and that's why he's talking about time in this mm -hmm. in this construct or free will in this construct. And it's like, and then you go to Aquinas, and you're like, oh man, Aquinas was you know getting some of this stuff from Augustine, who was getting this from Irenaeus, yeah. who was getting it from Polycarp, who was getting it from oh John the Evangelist, right? Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, this stuff it's all interconnected. And as if you pick one data point to kind of go into, mm -hmm. like maybe it's the the sacrament of the altar, it will open up, as you said, naturally all of these other areas that you're going to want to explore. If you have that childish faith mm -hmm. where you want to explore and you want to learn and you're hungry for it. Well, and that humility to imitate too, right? So Lewis, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily know what you're referencing, but Lewis is unapologetically saying, all right, I'm going to take Aquinas's outline. Mm -hmm. You know, you see that in basically any pastoral theology, right? It's borrowing its outline from somebody else. When we first started preaching, we didn't just write a sermon, right? You're imitating somebody else, you know, good artists copy down somebody else's artwork as they're learning how to paint. Mm -hmm. And so there's always this imitation. And, and once we've, one, whenever it happened, when society um, put innovation over imitation, mm -hmm. right? That's where we sort of had this break where poetry is now, I mean, buy any poetry book published in the last 10 years and like you'll throw it away because mm -hmm. it's garbage because it's not trying to imitate anything else mm -hmm. um you know jackson pollock he's from wyoming i'm supposed to love him right he did like the where he just threw paint all over you know okay drizzled paint like it's cool to look at but what is he imitating there he doesn't see that in nature he's not mm -hmm. imitating anything you know it's not there's no beauty there because there's no truth and there's no goodness mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's good yeah i always say whenever Whenever I preach, like this is not Brian Stecker just coming up with something. Right. It's me like, hey, here's here's my kind of thoughts. It's like, no, here's mm -hmm. the thoughts of the people that I respect, and I'm going to try to deliver it to you in the best yes. way that I possibly can. Yeah. And if not, then I'm cutting myself off as like a branch from the tree, and I'm going to starve. Yeah. So you don't want me to just tell you like Brian's thoughts and ramblings mm -hmm. unless it's deeply rooted and can be to some degree documented through that which we have inherited, which ultimately starts from that goodness, the truth, and that beauty that flows from God, and then lives and should live on within his church here on earth one of, one of my pastoral mentors said the other day um he goes we're, we're not i am not standing on the shoulders of giants he goes i am a flea on their head i am nothing compared to the giants on whom i stand and i think that's so beautiful that's i mean beautiful. you have to have this humility mm -hmm. and and when you're not humble why would you why would you ever read anybody that came before you mm -hmm. right what does some dead white guy have to say 
who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, I know better because I have my, my experiences, my context, my whatever. Mm -hmm. But we're always striving to make sense of our experiences. Right. Right. Why, why why am I struggling with this? What is going on? And this tradition gives you the context to Mm -hmm. better understand why am I struggling with this? Oh, maybe it's because I'm pursuing earthly pleasures and therefore I'm kind of caught up in this addictive nature towards this thing. The Bible and all of this tradition is going to give you the context to understand no, you pursue, you know, blessed are the ones who mourn, blessed mm-hmm. are the ones who are persecuted on my behalf, all of these kind of things that are then carried out through these grand stories and the teachings throughout the tradition and give so much context and beauty to it. You inherit that and you go, oh, I'm struggling with this. I think I can get to the root of it. And it's not because I want to talk to a psychologist. It's mm-hmm. when it's because I've been introduced to right thought and, yes. and, and real rooted truth that God desperately wants to give to me. And he's given me the tools to have mm-hmm. that. And I'm sure you see it all the time, you know, as, as a preacher, right? People are, are, are coming to these conclusions, um, almost, I don't want to say independent, right? But it's not like, you know, we were joking off mic, right? Of mm-hmm. this idea of like, well, I'm going to do a 12 week Bible study on why you should do X. And then by the end of it, people will be doing this. It's like, mm-hmm. that's not how humans learn. Um, you know, I just said about Augustine, it could be written today. And that's, especially in Bible studies, you know, we're at at my congregation, we're going through the, uh, we're just about to wrap up the David story and we're getting into the Solomon stuff. And so many of these things, everybody says, well, this sounds just like politicians today, or this sounds just like this. And the more you realize, yes, it does sound just like today because it is, you know, you, you're making these connections and then, um, you know, they're again, not independent, but sort of parallel to these things they're coming to these different conclusions so i had a parishioner the other day who came to me and said you know i finally realized that in order to live as a christian i don't have to be totally devoted to church work you know i serve god in my daily vocation i was like yeah Yeah. (laughs) like and i i haven't been preaching on this stuff right but she came to this conclusion by certainly hearing my sermons but also reading the scriptures thinking about these things praying through these things and, and this, just this continued humility, this continued return to what came before us, I think is it, it's the only way that there will be a future. Mm-hmm. And are you optimistic about that? I mean, I'm optimistic about the return of Christ yeah. and my own mortality. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't, I don't lose sleep over anything. Right. But I don't know. I, and I'm sort of by default, a very optimistic person. Mm-hmm. So yes. yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. I, I like to see the resurgences. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've been influenced by that um, in ways that even as I talk to, you know, even, even good Christians who have gone before me, they're being introduced to some of these things that I'm being introduced to at the same time that mm-hmm. I am, which shows me that there has been a resurgence of a focus on these things that we're talking about, which once again, I, I can't emphasize how much that's shaped my Christianity, my curiosity, mm-hmm. uh, the way that my, my, my days and my interests are formed is by being exposed to these things. And I know people that have been lifelong Christians who are exposed to those things. Th- they're being exposed at the same time that I am. And yeah. they're, they're saying the exact same thing. Right. Um, that gives me optimism to say one, that's, that's going on Two, those bad ideologies that have been growing up for a while have reached a point where most people are saying, that doesn't smell right. Yeah. You know, this Marxism that's creeped in mm-hmm. and these other bad ideologies, we're seeing where they lead and it's really ugly, which is why, you know, we've got a school at our church and it's like people are flocking to the school. Mm-hmm. And it's not because most of them are saying, you know, I'm a fully dedicated Christian. And by the way, pastor, can we talk about Augustine? Like yeah, that's right, not what right, they're right, doing. They're yeah. just saying, I don't like what's over here. You guys are doing something different and mm-hmm. it smells right. And that gives the opportunity to say, let me tell you why it smells right. It's right. not because Brian Stecker's a genius. Yeah. It's because I'm a flea on these giants. Mm-hmm. And by the way, do you want to go explore some of these giants? You know, yeah. it's a beautiful endeavor. And I, I think that people it. are interested. Absolutely. Mm. Well, Jacob, this has been fun. It's been a blast. We could probably go for another two hours, but Absolutely. I don't think anyone else is going to hang with us for another two hours. <laughs> ben, it might even fall asleep That's over there. Right. Um, so Jacob, if, if uh, any of the hearers that are still on board, if they wanted to learn more from you, access you, mm-hmm. where could they do that? Yeah, I mean, my my sermons are up on our church's website, St. John's Lo- stjohnslevel.org. Um, I've been Lovell, on- Wyoming, so if they just said St. St. John's yeah. in Lovell, Wyoming. St. John's Lovell, Wyoming, mm-hmm. yep. Um, I'm in one of these Christian culture magazines for a presentation I gave on the three estates, so I don't know, I th- just Google Jacob Benson Lutheran. Um, I'll slowly pop up with things, mm-hmm. but... Do you have any social media? No, not yeah, public. Me neither. Yeah, no, I do. Would you love it? But I don't know. You won't learn about me if you go on my social yeah. media. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, Jacob, thank you. This has been a blast. Yeah. I appreciate uh, the work you put into studying all of these different things. Um, and I hope that people are able to access this and learn and grow from that flea on the giants. That's right. Well, cool. Come back to Wyoming or I'll go and see you. I want to be back on. Yeah. Sounds good. Cool. Hey, cheers. Yep.